All right, are we good to go? Yeah. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to day two. I'm glad we're all here in this room and not all in our. I just yeah. Thanks to Terry, Don, and Alyssa at the back for like yeah organizing a great room so quickly. Um, okay, so we're going to start off with a kind of summary of uh, yesterday and what what we've tried to summarize yesterday evening from the breakouts, but we might not have captured everything. So we're hopefully we'll have some time for you all to chime in of things we might have missed. So I think. One of the things we learned yesterday is that we have a lot of challenges, which is good. Um, you know, internal variability can be large, uh, particularly in the extra tropics and in northern hemisphere winter time. And Clara demonstrated that very nicely. Um, of course, the challenge though is: do are our models giving us the right uh, inference about how large that internal variability is? And so we need to have methods to be able to kind of verify that. Uh, in the models, and Clara also talked about that. I think uh, something that was highlighted for me, at least, that I wasn't totally aware of is how large observational uncertainties can be. And we had a couple of examples there from Gavin and from Steve. And you know, observations were made the models look bad. Things got better because the observations changed, and then maybe now the observations have changed to make the models look bad again. So we have like, you know, quite a lot of uncertainties there. Um, we also heard about that in, in the context of precipitation trends as well. And also, of course, we have these issues that observations are not typically pure observations. There's some underlying models or assumptions that are going into them, which um, makes things challenging. And then for some features, we just haven't really observed properly, or we have very short observational records, which makes looking at trends very challenging. Um, we also have issues, of course, related to model structural differences or parametric uncertainty, um, which can lead to models doing different things. We didn't have too many examples of that yesterday. We had more examples of where all the models might be doing one thing and the observations are doing the other. But uh, one example was from Alexi, where we have different models where, that had different representations of the ocean dynamical thermostat and did different things in response to rising CO2. And then another thing that seems to be coming more and more apparent is these uncertainties related to the forcings themselves that we're giving the models. And there were a couple of examples yesterday, maybe they were really related. So Ray had the example about the Northern Hemisphere summer storm track trends, which seem to be better in CMIP 6 compared to CMIP 5, um, and kind of isolated the role of uh, biomass burning in that. Uh, and then Clara also showed the differences in northern hemisphere temperature trends with the same model, but CMIP 6 versus CMIP 5 forcings. Um, we also had some nice examples, which I think are very helpful of really trying to understand the mechanisms behind trends that we're seeing. So uh, Junsuk, for example, showed the role of different sea surface temperature regions and southern hemisphere storm track trends, which allows us to make sense of why the models might be doing something different if they're if we know they're not getting the sea surface temperature trends correctly, then that kind of starts to make more sense. Um, we had UA's talk about the role of the SAM and the sea surface temperatures and kind of demonstrating that that didn't really seem to be explaining what we're seeing there in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and then similarly, we had Letty's talk about the role of different forcings in um, Antarctic sea ice trends. Uh, there are also examples where, you know, maybe we're looking at the wrong metrics to begin with. We, we look at some metrics that are maybe very uncertain in the observations. And Ray had the nice example of um, kind of looking at Hadley cell aspects in the reanalysis, which maybe aren't constrained very well, and then kind of coming up with a different metric based on sea level pressure, which is maybe a more kind of observationally constrained quantities. And then we had a few examples where you could see that the discrepancies kind of matured. That was particularly true in, in Gavin's talk where you kind of maybe come across a discrepancy and then dig in more and start to realize, oh, maybe the observations are, are not quite right. Um, and then maybe you know new metrics give different insights. In some cases, the observational record just lengthens and you kind of go out of there being a discrepancy. The hiatus is maybe an example of that. Um, and then you know, there were also examples of you know, doing targeted experiments to really try and understand where um, these discrepancies uh, are coming from. 
And I think what was clear from the breakouts is that maybe dividing into these categories of good, bad, and not looked at enough, that's maybe not sufficient because we have different types of situations. You know, we have we have some situations where a model predicts a feature, and that's exactly what happens in the real world, but we get the magnitude wrong. So arctic amplification is maybe an example of that, which maybe should be seen as a success of models, like they predicted arctic amplification, and that's what's happening. Uh, but maybe we're not getting the amplitude of that quite right. And there are a couple of exam other examples that were listed in the breakouts there as well. Uh, then we have situations where all models do the same thing and they might be doing something different from observations. I think the Eastern Tropical Pacific and the Southern Ocean sea surface temperatures are a pretty clear example of that. Um, I don't think we had too many examples of this yesterday, but where models might do very different things from one another, but they kind of encompass the observations. So then you want to try and you know, narrow down which models do we think are the right ones and are they getting things right for the right reasons? And then maybe we can narrow down our uncertainties that way. Then there's cases where internal variability is so large that it's really hard to say anything um, with the observational record, but maybe we still have structural uncertainties across the models that can be large. And then there's situations where everything is good, where the observations sit nicely within the model distribution, but we still want to check, you know, are they doing things right for the right reason? So I think this kind of raised the question is, what do we consider to be a success of the models? Is it fine? I mean, they, we have great successes like Arctic amplification and many of the basic features of climate change that models have predicted for a long time, but now it's kind of like, is that enough? We want to get the, the actual magnitudes of things right. So I'll hand it over to Tiffany now, who will go over kind of what you came up with in the breakout sessions. Okay. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for your participation yesterday. We got really extensive reports from all the different groups, and that's really what makes this um, so work so well, and will be very helpful as we feed in, into our reporting on the on the conference. Yeah. So I'm going to go through the different categories, and it's it's just going to be. The items uh, that were common themes that emerged across the different groups, and we're going to start with good. And I think a lot of the groups hit on the same things as Isla was saying: the successes, the things that were predicted early long on, the things that we need to look for because our models told us to look for them, and that I think is a metric of success. So a lot of it had to do with temperature, but you see the hydrological cycle, you see storm tracks, um, the things in. Green throughout will be those that appeared in different categories, which we found kind of interesting. <laughs> Just getting at this idea that one person's discrepancy may not be another, and that's going to feed nicely into this afternoon's discussion about what is the kind of protocol that we might agree upon um, for some kind of setting a bar, not the bar, but um, a bar. And that includes um, humidity trends, which of course um, in bulk global senses or in you know land versus ocean might be okay, but as we'll see in the next case, when you zoom in, it's um, maybe not as good as you might think. And then others like ozone hole, snow cover, and Indian Ocean SSTs. Uh, we collected references, but for this, this particular table, we didn't include those. So that was the good. Um, uh, one thing that came up for good also was some of this is, you know, synthesized already in the IPCC. So in my group, we thought, okay, we'll just cite the IPCC. Uh, and certainly for temperature, there's a lot of that and even now extremes. I mean, one could argue that good could be based on the definition of detection attribution, because you can only detect and attribute something if the model has fidelity um, in being able to, to simulate the signal. So that really opens the door to, I think, a lot of good. Um, but then, of course, there's quite a number of things that were perceived as bad, and you can just see the list here. And I, I, we noted some things that, again, appeared in multiple categories, like this Indian Ocean SST, which my group was, you know, really suggesting it was bad, and clearly some other groups um, were not as in agreement. We also have the warming hole, which came up also in my group, and. These, this is the humidity, but when we zoom in on local in local regions, in particular arid and semi arid regions. Okay, and then not been looked at enough and I think this is where there's, you know, the opportunity and this, I think, opened up a lot of things, especially to do with the ocean or other components of the earth system permafrost fires and you can see it all here. 
some of them appeared before like ice and the warming hole and stratospheric ozone, but there's clearly a lot of work to do um, to investigate more trends. Okay, and then don't know, and the question about that more or less came down to, you know, did the model, the models not have the physics in them to even look at these processes? Will they in the next cycle of CMIP-7? And, or we just don't have observational records. It came up as we'll see later, how long is long enough uh, to, to define a trend? That question we'll touch upon in a minute and we'll open it up for discussion. So here again, and so AMOC, maybe there's too much noise. I mean, these are all in, important things that we have to think about and keep an eye on. So there are some more at the bottom. Uh, these are just, I guess, extraneous things that we defined as others. So downscaling, you know, one might argue some signals are just not expected because our models can't even do those. The physics in the models is not uh, capable. So severe weather, there's trends in severe weather, tornadoes across the U.S. Southwest, sorry, the U.S. Southeast. And, um, you know, our models can't tell them. The global scale models can't tell us about that, but we can downscale and they're doing that at um, M M car M cubed um, to look at uh, trends in severe weather. Clouds, you know, a lot of challenges there. And, and so, so that's the sort of summary. This will feed into day three when uh, during the breakout, we'll kind of start to tackle these and kind of upscale some for community, you know, further steps, especially related to understanding why the models um, have these bad, <laughs> why we have these bad situations. But I think I want to just now summarize a few questions that came out when we were just discussing as groups and then open the floor for further comment on the sim synthesis here and any you know further feedback. So the, one of the big things, especially highlighted in the context of Clara's talk, is what do we do when we have large observational uncertainty? What do we do when the noise is large or the noise in the observations or the models? Um, I think this is a really important question. And can we carve out the landscape of regions and seasons where this is really acute um, from maybe regions and seasons where the signal to noise is a lot higher? How do we separate out whether models are doing the multi-decadal variability wrong or the forced response wrong? This is not unrelated to the first question. And the signal to noise paradox, I think, came up in many groups or discussions yesterday. That certainly feeds in to this question, which will be discussed actually in the session uh, today, one of our sessions today. And then this kind of looming question, I think Laura brought it up in our discussion, you know, when is a trend a trend? And how, what do we think about, you know, the length of the time series? Um, I think that's an important one. And then also came up about mean state biases. We've looked and evaluated our models based on the mean state for a long time. The question is, how does that interface with looking at their fidelity in, 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 in these sort of signals uh, that we're seeing? And emerging constraints is obviously one way that the community has used to tackle this, but I think it'd be great to have a discussion about how we might, you know, continue to, to interface these two things. So that's our summary. And we now open the floor up to questions or feedback, um, what people think about the, the discussion yesterday or these questions. I'm happy to to hear your thoughts. Oh, oh Paolo, yeah. Sorry, we're gonna have one more uh, group. Paolo, who is the online chair of the discussion. Paolo, are you there? Yep. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Maybe. Can you hear me okay? Oh, there he is. Okay, now I need to know how to get uh, if you could uh can you hear me? Oh there he is. <laughs> One second. Oh, okay. no. Yeah. We can hear you online, Paolo, but I'm not that's sure. If they, they, I'm not sure if they can hear you in the room. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the question. Yeah. Can somebody turn on the chat for the for the online session so that we can so, log in without having to speak up? Okay. Okay, we can hear you, Gavin. So. Um, can you hear me? Paolo, we can hear you. We can see yeah. you too. Great. Please go ahead. Great. Yeah, well, I don't know if it was worth the path because uh, I have little to say or to add to what you were just saying, which was very extensive. Maybe one thing from the virtual session or maybe a couple of things to highlight from the virtual session, um, which we just had. So in terms of like the good, 
we were quite pessimistic uh, because we felt like a lot of the things that appear good might be good for the wrong reasons, if that makes sense. So even, for example, the global mean temperature trend, which at face value is, is right in the models, broadly speaking, um, uh, we had this discussion of can we actually trust that given that the models are so wrong in terms of the Pacific SST trends uh, with known implications for the related budget and the feedbacks and so on. Um, and generally speaking, we felt like the, the big integral values, which are the things that have less noise and that you want the models to get right, are also tend to be hard to verify because uh, of lack of data. So when you think about global ocean heat uptake, that doesn't go back so long in time from observations. Um, and maybe another point to highlight, we had, um, we had uh, Tim from ECMWF uh, who was making some good points about uh, the value of short-term forecasts uh, in verifying the models. So um, I think a lot of us are kind of in global climate modeling space and we think about uh, decadal or longer-term projections, but there's also a lot to learn from shorter-term uh, forecasts like that are initialized in, in a controlled way. Uh, to learn about model biases and and uh, yeah shortcomings, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Uh, I guess if anyone else from the online session wants to add something, they can do so in the discussion. Thanks. All right, and um, Amy, are you there for your virtual breakout yesterday? That would you? So I see, there? Amy, but okay. uh, I see Letty and Alan. So if either of y'all wants to speak up, um, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay. I'm not sure that we have much more to add um, over what's already been said. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so now we'll open it up both virtually and in the room for a discussion about the major themes. And there's a microphone at the back so that the virtual participants can hear you. So Alyssa will bring that over. Okay, we have already a comment. Herve, do you want to, if you're online, can you just unmute yourself and share your comment with everyone, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I had just a comment about the fourth question, uh, the, the relationship between biases and trends. And I was recently in a PhD jury uh, for uh, Marcelin Gilbert at IPSL, and he has looked at uh, trends uh, in the Indian summer monsoon precipitation and looking across uh, CMIP6 models about uh, the relationship between biases and trends using uh, a maximum covariance analysis, for instance. So if we have a, a large number of independent models, this kind of statistical tool can be applied to look for a systematic relationship between patterns of biases and patterns of trends. Okay, great, thank you. Rob. Microphone, Alyssa, do you have the microphone? Thank you. Uh, one thing I, I wanted to raise based on a discussion last night that is kind of related to the first question here is uh, since we are a bunch of climate modelers, mostly, uh, I don't think there's a lot of observational people in the room. I think we should uh, think about what we do as we think about these confronting models with observations to also engage with the observational community and um, Continue uh, that there are make sure there continue to be good observations to compare against and and see what we can do to help uh, improve some of these observational uncertainties. So just maybe a challenge as we think about this to also consider the observational side of things and what we can do to engage with them. Yeah, that's a great point. And even just new observations coming online, like we heard about from Gavin yesterday, that can be helpful. Okay, someone raised their hand online. You want to go? I didn't catch the name, but if uh, yeah, that's me again. I, oh, I, I, it's just a technical thing. Can somebody turn on the chat feature in the WebEx? Because otherwise, okay. I you know I we can't make comments without screaming to the room. Yeah, the chat feature is on. If you go to the lower right corner, you should be able to click on it. I can. Uh, I would say I can chat you, but. Um, If you're not seeing that option, you may have to uh, get out of the meeting and rejoin. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, thank you very much. Sanjeev, who's Okay, yeah, Sanjeev, would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself? 
Uh, yeah, I wanted to make a point about uh, number one and number three. So, uh, so yeah, there is a large uncertainty in the observational data set if you look into like many of the remote sensing product. But if you uh, look into many of the measurement product where there is a, a site where people measure it like uh, uh, various observational based product, then the uncertainty is not as large as uh, uh, has been talked about, like uh, whether you look into the CRO temperature versus other temperature data set. Uh, similarly, for the number three, uh, yeah, for the trend, there is a established method, rigorous statistical method to establish when a trend is called trend whether it is a significant or not, whether it is outside of internal variability or not. There is vast literature in the hydrology community about how to compute the trend significant. Uh, yeah, it's, it has to be longer, but it has to first, first pass through that significance test before you can talk about a trend is a trend. Great. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop it there. Yeah, thank you. If you could share that reference you mentioned in the chat, that would be helpful to see. Yeah. But just following up on that point, I think one of the challenges we face is that we could have statistically significant trends. We just don't know enough of the characteristics of the internal variability to know, you know, is it multi-decadal variability or a forced trend, which is kind of one of the other questions we had. I have a comment or a question. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Um, so when, when we're talking about this, like trying to figure out if in the face of internal variability, if our trends are meaningful or not, I wonder if we could leverage all of the lots of effort that has, people have done on, in the weather community, thinking about how to verify model forecasts. Um, I think that could maybe be some of that might be able to be adapted because there's like quite sophisticated infrastructure in the weather forecasting communities and they have lots of data to what, verify things on a regular basis. And I wonder if we could adapt some of those things to like specifically model projections, like verifying trend forecasts, projections. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm hoping that maybe we'll touch on that in some of the kind of new applications and methodology section where maybe like what, what can initialized prediction tell us about how our models are doing for long-term trends. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, not oh. with initialized prediction. I mean, but just the, me like weather uh, yeah. verification methods and thinking about what that means in the context of like climate projections. Right, yeah, I guess just related, just like, well, yeah, what can we learn from, sorry. Yeah, online is in the camera, my apologies. Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. It came up in our group, Karen and I, like the difference between the types of predictions and how you measure skill. The trends are now a potential measure, but it wasn't obvious to us. And I, I know people have thought really deeply about using those metrics for climate, but maybe now it's finally the time where we, we have, you know, signals that we can, we can use. That was a little self-serving of me to okay. ask, to comment on because I, I'm, on the joint uh, working group for forecast verification research um, from the WMO, WWRP, WCRP. And so that's like a thing that people put me on there for right. an interface between the weather community and the climate community. And I don't know, I don't think that the actual intention was this, but I, I think that what we should do is try and use some verification methods for trends. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought, I don't know what the details are yet, but I, I think that we should, as a community, think about that. Yeah. Thanks, Angie. There's a comment here from Gavin that there are pretty good statistical tools for determining whether trends are meaningful. I guess this is back to question three and um, that's really helpful. So again, it would be really useful to have those references in the chat, Gavin, if you could add those, that would be great. Um, I think, you know, from this NWP global climate prediction perspective, I think one thing that maybe is really a distinction with the difference is we need to know in our models that they're getting the right answer for the right reason. And we want to know because, you know, our, we're process based, right? For the longest time, that's all we could do is improve our models based on the physics, the processes. 
So, you know, if we have signals like Arctic amplification, I think we want to know that it's not just the signal, but why, what feedback is dominating it in the real world versus in our model. And I think calling the ensemble that way might be very helpful. We have one minute. So if there's any other quick comments before we transition to the session, please um, make sure you get the microphone. So uh, it's good to see, you know, you, you represent the model spread. Uh, but when you compare with observations, um, I usually only see like one or kind of few uh, measurements. I mean, uh, uh, data or, or uh, one type of, of instrument. So I think you know, it would be good to promote, uh, on, you know, to the observation community that uh, you know we should have also multiple observation, you know, shooting for the same thing. Uh, for example, the the TLA, you know, L, you know, LOR and in you know, short wave and, uh, and the long wave. Uh, there are different instruments that can measure that. And also, on the, uh, I saw yesterday there were some, uh, uh, you know, people treat the uh, real analysis as a, as a observation, which are true for most part because they are simulate observations. I mean, the satellite observations and others, but they are uh, variables. They are not that good yet. Uh, I saw, you know, the water is in the green for the good part, but I think, you know, if, if, if you if you compare the reanalysis of uh, like uh, uh, PR2 versus, uh, you know, EIA, uh, the water anomaly or trend are quite different, quite yeah. different. So we need more observations to get into not only the total column of water, but also the profile yeah. as well. So. That's a really good point, and it'll nicely interface with the discussion this afternoon where we think about the protocol, what observations we need to bring, and ideally always more than one. Okay, so that's uh, the wrap up of day one discussion. So thank you everyone for your contributions, and we're going to transition now to the first session of day two. So I'll hand it to the chairs. Uh, hopefully, I get yeah, maybe. Okay, good morning. My name is Eric Fisher. I'm going to chair this first session in the morning. Um, we learned yesterday, and Isla reminded us that variability is large, but that was with a mean state. And today is going to be about extremes, and I guess variability is gigantic in terms of extremes. And this variability can also change, could increase or decrease. And this is what, can, what we're going to talk about this morning in the first part. And we would like to start with the first talk by Karen McKinnon. It's our invited talk, and I'll try to, maybe I still need some help. Alrighty, let's see, do I have a mouth? Cool. Um, well, wonderful to see everyone here, and thanks again for the organizers for getting us all in person again. Um, so yeah, today we're going to jump into extremes, and I'm going to be talking about heat extremes. Um, Claire alluded to the observational large ensemble and that I might talk about it. I'm actually not talking about it at all, um, but if you're interested in it, I'm happy to talk with you um, offline or, or after uh, this talk uh, about that topic. So. Um, I have kind of a, a mouthful of a title here, um, but what I want to think broadly about in this talk is kind of, you know, what are some of the specific challenges that we have in quantifying trends and heat extremes? Because that's quite important for our ability to actually even think about how do we compare models and observations. So, uh, the first one I want to bring up and which Eric already nicely alluded to is that once we get to extremes, the contribution of internal variability gets even larger than what we had for the mean. Um, so this is just shown in one example from uh, a figure from uh, Perkins Kirkpatrick et al in 2017. Um, and in this, they basically did one of the initial analyses of how the observations fit or do not fit uh, into a suite of climate model simulations, in this case, just from the CESM one large ensemble. So what's shown on the top panels um, is the, on the left side, uh, trends in heat extremes measured by number of heat waves days per decade uh, over a longer period, 55 to 2010, and on the right over a shorter period of 98 to 2010. And then on the bottom, they're actually just focusing on this figure on kind of the lower range of how small could your trends in heat extremes be due to sampling of internal variability. So on the bottom is the first percentile across the CESM one large ensemble um, of trends in those same heat extreme metrics for that longer period on the left and the shorter period on the right. Um, and the takeaway here is basically, you know, I, I think that 
they don't totally quantify it in this paper, but I think the observations are kind of within CESM1, but for any kind of given trend, we have a very, very large range of what we could expect due to sampling internal variability. So what this means to me is that actually, you know, any comparison between trends and extremes and observations, we can really only do in this kind of golden era of large ensembles. And I think it's actually a case when I was reviewing the literature that we have more work to do to do some of those quantitative comparisons across large numbers of models. And I'll talk about some of my own work on that at the end. Um, so I do want to give two examples where people have tried to pull out these signals in climate models and compare them to observations by usually doing some combination of spatial aggregation and using large ensembles. Um, so this is from uh, Neil et al. in 2016 using an earlier version of CESM, this is CTSM, uh, but still kind of an early large ensemble. Um, what they were looking at specifically in the US is they were comparing um, on the x-axis here, US average temperature anomalies during the summertime. And on the y-axis here is a ratio of daily record highs to record lows. So basically in any given year across the US, how many record highs have been broken compared to how many record lows have been broken. And of course, in a stationary climate, you would just expect that to kind of be the same on average year to year. But what we're seeing is climate change, you're breaking those record highs much more. So the top plot is showing observations uh, and they basically fit aligned to that with some uncertainty estimate from a statistical methodology. On the bottom is the results from the large ensemble. So you can interpret the gray as basically the spread and the observational statistical estimate. And then the um, dots are from the model, black historical, red in the future. And you can see that in general, um, CCSM was showing a faster increase in heat extremes in the US than you based conditional on mean temperature. Uh, than what we saw in the observations, and they hypothesized that that was connected to anomalous decreases in precipitation um, and uh, decreases in evapotranspiration in the model. So kind of the model drying out a little bit too much that's connected to warm biases that have been persistent across models, uh, mostly in kind of the central United States. So that's the case where the models seem to be overdoing heat extremes. Um, but luckily, Alyssa allowed me to update my slides this morning, so I realized I wanted to give an example of the other case, because that's not kind of a general case. That was the U.S. Um, this is a more recent paper uh, in Nature Communications from 2023, looking at how uh, now using, you know, basically climate model large ensembles or really kind of every simulation available in CMIP-6, and looking at in Europe, where do the observed trends fall compared to the models? So on the left hand side uh, is a plot showing the number or the percent rather of simulations in CMIP-6 with trends that are greater than what we've observed in ERA-5 for summertime maximum temperatures and on the right for summertime mean temperatures. And blue means that fewer models um, exceed what we've observed. And so what you can see is they've pulled out this region uh, in Western Europe with that blue box where there's been uh, particularly for those hot extreme trends, the observations are falling not entirely outside the model spread, but pretty far at the edge of that model spread with only a handful of models warming more than the observation. So in this case in Western Europe, we're kind of seeing the opposite of what we saw in the US where the models seem to be underestimating the observed warming. And, and they've argued this is connected to forced dynamical trends. It's a much larger interesting discussion that we won't get into in this talk. Okay. But I want to kind of zoom out now more broadly to think about how do we even think about and talk about heat extremes and how do we quantify them? And for me, one challenge I found in looking at the literature is that people love to define different metrics of heat extremes. People often ask me, how do you define a heat extreme? What's the right answer? I used to say there's no right answer, but I'm starting to feel that there is a right answer, which I'll get to. Um, and the reason is that people define these metrics. Uh, and many of them are actually a really strong function of the mean state. So I'm going to give you three examples here where in all cases, there's some kind of synthetic true climate change signal that is easy. You take a summertime temperature distribution of any form and you warm it by some amount. I like to call this like the rigid shift. Just take your distribution, don't change the shape, just move it towards warmer temperatures. But what we will see is that if you use some of these classical heat extreme metrics that pop up in the literature, you get very complicated results that depend on the underlying shape of your distribution. So in this first example, we're going to think about someone deciding to measure heat extremes as the number of days that exceed a certain threshold. And that depends directly on the underlying or kind of climatological width of your distribution. So um, in this figure, there's kind of that rigid shift shown by that red arrow. On the top is the case where there's um, a wider distribution. 
On the bottom is a case where there's a narrower distribution. That red vertical line is kind of a present day threshold. So let's say you're, you know, you want to say how many days are beyond the 95th percentile. And what you can really visually see is that in the wider distribution, you have a, a smaller increase in number of days beyond that threshold. And in the narrower one, you have a much larger increase. So if your metric is number of days that exceed a certain threshold, then that's going to depend very, very heavily on your underlying distribution, which might also differ between models and observations and can make it hard to even compare things, for instance, across space. Um, this is the same idea, but thinking about a non normal distribution. So this is from look at the Neelan in 2015 um, and they've kind of done their PDF in this. Uh, log space. So it's kind of confusing. I think if you're, but if you're not used to looking at these, but basically on the top is showing an example of a short tail distribution. So negative skewness. Uh, and on the bottom is showing uh, the X axis is if you shifted the distribution by some standard deviation, but again, kind of a rigid shift so just moving everything warmer. And then on the Y axis is if you're looking at some percent of days that exceed a pre specified threshold, again, a percentile based threshold. The green is what you'd get if everything was normally distributed. And then because this is a short tail distribution, you actually get the black uh, where you have um, a, a different function in terms of what percent of days are going to exceed that threshold. That's a pretty direct function of how short tail this distribution is. So if you went to a long tail distribution, you would see the opposite. And the third example is my favorite and I think kind of the most pernicious for two reasons. So uh, people often like to talk about how has the probability of a certain extreme change in the future in the past. You see this in the news all the time. This thing was 50 times more likely with climate change. The problem with that, there's two things going on. So the first is what's shown on the bottom. Um, let's just focus on this uh, orange line on the bottom. This is a case where I've taken a negatively skewed distribution and I have again just shifted it towards warmer temperatures. On the X axis is the percentile which you've defined your extreme. So it exceeds on the left hand side, the 90th percentile on the right hand side, the 99th percentile. And on the Y axis is that probability metric. How much more probable is this event in our future? You can see this is a strongly nonlinear function, meaning that number you're calling out depends directly on what threshold you chose, which is kind of arbitrary. Then this is pernicious for a second reason. So I've compared with that orange one we were just talking about a negatively skewed distribution on the right is a positively skewed distribution. It's kind of getting to the same with the Leukath and Neelan paper that what that function looks like of how the future versus past probability changes depends very heavily on the underlying skewness of the distribution. Again, in all of these cases, the real answer is that everything has just gotten warmer by two degrees Celsius. So. My modest proposal is, can we stop all of the heat extreme exceedances and counting days? And um, in most cases, I think you can more simply measure extremes or changes in extremes as the change in temperature for a given percentile. And if you're thinking about the max, that's kind of the 100th percentile. And you would just say the maximum temperatures have gotten X degrees warmer under climate change. This does not answer all things about heat extremes. If you really care about persistence or something, obviously there are other metrics you might need to care about. Um, but I think in general things simplify if we just think about how is the distribution changing in a relative sense using a degree Celsius metric. Okay. So I now want to talk about how we would even kind of frame or get to describing that metric and what the important questions are in terms of thinking about heat extremes. So when we talk about extremes, I like to actually think that we're at the top of a hierarchy of different processes in the climate system that we can build up to understand changes in heat extremes. So um, the first thing is global mean temperature. So I want to think about kind of our first metric is how fast is global mean temperature warming? That connects, of course, directly to, for instance, Maria's work on climate sensitivity, super important. That's going to be the base of our kind of hierarchy building up to understanding changes in heat extremes. But then when we talk about heat extremes, I'm talking about continental heat extremes, not marine. So the next kind of part of our hierarchy is, okay, how is land warming compared to ocean? So that's kind of be our, you can think about, okay, how are heat extremes changing compared to global land temperature? Um, I'm talking about summer. So you could then think about, okay, how are summer temperatures warming compared to average or annual mean temperatures? And then you can think about the regional patterns. So you can think about some regression maybe of local summer average temperature onto something like global summer average temperature or global mean temperature. And then finally, at the top of this hierarchy, we finally get to our extremes. And so how are those changing? And I often like to think about things as kind of these last two steps of the hierarchy. So 
conditional on local summer average temperatures. Are extremes warming in a way that's consistent with those averages, or are they warming in a way that is inconsistent, suggesting some type of change in variability, like Eric alluded to in his introduction? But that's not to say that these other parts of the hierarchy are not important. And indeed, this is another challenge across the literature, is that if you think about this as a regression problem, people often regress local extremes against you know, one of these other things in here. So you might be comparing to global mean temperature, but in that case, I think you need to understand, okay, does this regression depend on, you know, how land is amplified compared to ocean, how summer is amplified compared to annual mean, all these kind of additional questions pop up. And I think are important to understand how we really get to our changes in summertime extremes. Okay. Um, I don't know what time we started. How much time do I have left? Five minutes. Okay. Um, so I will, uh, Talk about this very briefly. Another challenge that comes to extremes again links back to our non normality uh, question. So, um, motivated by some of my earlier work in this kind of discussion of internal variability, in recent times I've really wanted to understand a kind of a broad, large scale where we can get over averaging our internal variability. How are extremes changing compared to local average summer temperatures? But a kind of uh, seemingly unrelated paper that Isla and I wrote on the Pacific Northwest heat wave kind of gave me an, a crisis about how to quantify this. And the crisis is, is summarized in this plot. So what this plot is showing is skewness, how heavy one tail is versus the other, compared to kurtosis on the y-axis, how heavy both tails are. And the colors are showing across the ESM2 force response removes, so internal variability only, how extreme in sigma units is the most extreme event. And what you can see is there's a really clear structure here that in some ways is obvious, but I think also underappreciated, where if you climatologically have heavier tails in the upper extremes, so that's going to be high skewness and high kurtosis, an extreme of a given probability, in this case, this is roughly a 1 in 8,500 year probability, is more extreme in sigma units. Why does this matter? It means that when you average over locations, which are going to span different skewness and kurtosis kind of climatologically, Things get complicated because, you know, in one case, a one in 8,500 year extreme is a five sigma event. In other case, it could be a two sigma event. Um, and then in addition, that can lead to apparent trends and extremes just com that come from sampling alone. If you happen to sample kind of, you know, heavy tailed regions versus light tailed regions in a given year, that can skew your probability of extremes if you're measuring them in something like sigma units. And in addition, if models and observations differ in these distributions, which they do tend to, then you might not be comparing like with like in a way you don't necessarily realize. So all of that motivated some work that I'll talk about at the very end here. Um, but just to sum up, there's kind of two, I think, key challenges right now in terms of understanding and comparing models and observations. One is that the contribution of internal variability to extremes is very large. Um, and then this thing of the probability of a given extreme being spatially variable due to non-normality in temperature extremes, or in temperature, excuse me. Okay, so this is just the thing I want to wrap up with because it finally will get to the good and the bad of the climate models um, as that we've been doing some work trying to kind of answer this question, figure out how to average information across space in order to answer this question of our, our hot extremes amplified compared to summertime means. Um, I'm just going to show you a synthetic data, made up data, how this methodology works. Um, what's shown up here, you can imagine years are on the X axis, some made up temperature data is on the Y axis. Um, they're vertically stacked dots. You can imagine that's like 90 days per summer are each of these dots. Um, and what's shown on top of that is the median for each year and the maximum for each year. And I've made this data to be a normal distribution with increasing variance. So the difference between that red and the blue line is increasing over time. PNC is quite noisy with this data that has you know, somewhat reasonable characteristics. Uh, if we look at that difference, red minus blue over time, it's shown here, so you can actually start to see a pretty clear trend, but I want to avoid this non-normality issue I just talked about, so I'm actually going to transform this into ranks, where the highest rank is the case where you have the largest difference between the maximum and the median. And the advantage there is that now we're in rank space and everything is distributed in the same way, and we can do spatial averaging in a really easy way. So in this case, again, I've made this data to have what I like to call amplification, faster warming of the extremes than the mean. So I think there's some nice advantages of this approach. We lose that dependence on the underlying distribution. Um, we kind of know the distribution, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but we can actually then define heat waves in different ways. But then since we move everything to rank space, we can intercompare the results with those different definitions. 
Um, so I'm going to show you using ERA five daily maximum temperatures trends over 1959 to 2023. Um, we've talked about data issues. The reason I'm using ERA five here is I want to do large scale global averaging. You can't do that with station data, but in as much as possible, we validated these results with station data, and I can talk about that offline. Okay, so this is what we see for amplification um, in terms of a map. So what's shown here is the trend in that rank. All you need to know is that red is increasing amplification, blue is damping, extremes warming less fast than the mean. And then if you can see any of those white places, contours, that's where a trend is identified as locally significant after controlling for multiple hypothesis testing. And the take home is that you really can't find, it's very, this is a small signal. It's really hard to find any signal if it is there. Um, and so we then are able now, since we're in rank space, to average across space, because that's always a thing that's great to do in climate, to get rid of some of this noise, um, and ask what do these trends look like when you average across large domains of the globe, northern hemisphere, tropics, and southern hemisphere. And the main take home in the observations is that there's basically no trends anywhere at these large scales. Once you average across hemispheres, the extremes are really following mean or median temperatures. Uh, over the historical period. Um, this is looking at the cold summertime temperatures, but doing the same thing. This map looks a lot more blue. And indeed, especially in the tropics in the southern hemisphere, we actually do see differences where the coldest summertime temperatures are warming less quickly than the median. So we don't actually see the rigid shift on both sides. We see it on the, the upper side, but not the lower side. Okay. We're talking about models. I'm sorry, I'm rushing at the end here, but we've now compared you know, this to all the CMIT models. Um, and this is uh, everything kind of available in the standard CMIP uh, archive, uh, except for CESM2, which for some reason is never listed in the standard CMIP models. I haven't added it, so I apologize for that. Um, what's shown on the Y axis is that trend in ranks for these upper tail extremes. Uh, and the observations are shown in purple. The uh, each model simulation is a black dot. The ensemble mean when there's multiple models is a red dot. And the green line, if you can see it, is the average across those red dots. So kind of an it's a multi-model ensemble mean, ensemble mean. Um, the gray is some estimate of kind of a null hypothesis of, of no trends. And the main takeaway here is that uh, this is one of those weird cases where the observations of the ensemble mean identify like eerily as like the same number, uh, with maybe the southern hemisphere being a little bit different. Um, so this is the good. Uh, the climate models are doing the same thing as the observations in the historical period, that they are also showing at these larger scales that the extremes are following the median. Um, here is the bad. So this is uh, showing that lower tail where we saw that damping, or I should say relatively slower warming of the lower tail of summertime extremes. Um, and there, the, again, the observations are the purple. So you can see that they're outside and below that gray envelope, uh, meaning that there's kind of a significant decrease in the globe driven by the tropics in the Southern hemisphere uh, in terms of the rate of warming of that lower tail. Uh, but the models still show that rigid shift behavior. The green is kind of within our null hypothesis, and so they're not really capturing that extension of the lower tail. Um, and we have, through further analysis, I don't have time to show today, I think this is probably related to actually the structure of precipitation trends conditional on temperature. So how is the distribution of precipitation changing at you know, low versus average temperatures? Um, so that's our hypothesis for now. And I think I'm out of time. So I just want to say that there's been a lot of uh, work also thinking about how does the mean state bias in models uh, for temperature extremes, what does that look like? Um, that's not necessarily always linked to the trends, but this is one example from Ucola et al, where they're basically showing that the models tend to show more coupling between land and atmosphere on heat extreme days and regions that are wet compared to observations where they often don't show coupling on those days. So I think that we, at the process level, you know, even though I showed that nice agreement, I think we still have a lot to understand because we know there are actually mean biases in land atmosphere interactions, among other things. Uh, so this might be a good with a star where, you know, even though the agreement is good with the lack of amplification, we should be cognizant of uh, issues in terms of uh, processes. 
Okay, so I will just leave those up for one second until uh, Eric changes my slides, and then I'll just do a, a brief uh, shout out that if you want to join my group, get in touch because we have some money to work on these topics and would love to have anyone uh, reach out about that. So thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, so thanks uh, to the organizers for having me here and uh, also thanks uh, for organizing this uh, excellent meeting. Um, so this is work I've been doing on uh, pool extreme trends. So this is with Michael Sigmund, who's also at CCCMA, and also James James Green, who's at the University of Exeter. Okay, so for some of the motivations, so so long term trends and model projections show a pretty clear uh, decrease in cold extremes over the northern hemisphere in latitudes, and this is very robust regardless of metric used or the model that's used. And so because of this, the IPC. IPCC has very strong uh, language regarding um, the confidence in the, the changes in extreme cold, uh, both in the past as well as projections. However, uh, if you look over some more recent trends, um, you may get a bit of a different picture. So, it's an example from uh, Cornell 2014. It's a bit hard to see, but uh, it's just showing a plot of the coldest daily minimum temperature. Uh, over average over the mid latitude of the northern hemisphere mid latitudes, we see uh, clear warming, followed by uh, starting around the 1990s, quite a dramatic decrease in the minimum temperature. So that's an increase in the intensity of cold extremes over the mid latitudes, um, and this occurred at the same time as uh, rapid Arctic warming and sea ice loss. So it motivated a lot of studies uh, trying to link the two, and there have been quite a few studies. Uh, that have attributed this uh, increase in cold extremes or the latitudes to changes in the polar vortex or jet stream that's caused by Arctic warming, um, and that the models actually poorly capture these changes. And this gets a lot of attention in the media whenever an extreme cold event occurs. Uh, it often gets blamed on in climate change because of these changes and uh, these proposed changes in uh, its atmospheric circulation. So this uh, apparent discrepancy between these uh, recent uh, short-term trends and these uh, and these projections has led to some to question that our the climate models, uh, climate model projections of cold extremes and the IPCC's conclusion. Um, however, despite the, uh, the, the prominence of this uh, kind of model observation discrepancy in the Arctic mid latitudes link literature, uh, including an entire review paper on this topic, uh, there has been a lack of direct model observ observation comparisons uh, taking into account um, internal variability. Um, so that's what uh, this uh, study we're doing is we're kind of searching for evidence of a model observation discrepancy um, in mid latitude cold extreme trends uh, by directly comparing observations to large ensemble uh, climate model simulations. So is there anything about the recent trends that are unexpected or relative to what the models uh, predict? Uh, so we look at both the mid latitude average as well as uh, the spatial distribution of the trends. Um, so, just a quick overview of some of the data and metrics uh, that we're using. So, for observations, we're just using ERA 5 reanalysis. I have looked at other uh, data products, including uh, Japanese, Japanese reanalysis, as well as the Berkeley Earth uh, daily uh, data, and you get basically the same answers. Um, but I'm, for the most part, I'm only going to show ERA 5 reanalysis. And so, for models, we're using some historical and SSP simulations from seven different uh, single model initial conditional ensembles. So, see the, the models listed there. So it's a total of 300 realizations um, across the models. And so for the metrics, so to kind of capture the intensity of, uh, of extreme cold, I use a metric I call TMN, which is just the minimum daily average temperature in each winter. Um, and then for to capture the frequency, uh, using a metric which I call TM5P, which is just the number of days in each winter uh, that are below the, the daily average or below the, the, the fifth percentile, although apparently maybe I shouldn't be using this metric. Um, so an issue that arises is that uh, some of these uh, models show uh, a lot more global warming over the recent period compared to observations. And so the purpose of this is not to evaluate the climate sensitivity. Uh, we wanna know how uh, cool extremes are changing in a warmer climate. Um, so to kind of account for these kind of known biases, we, do, we can rescale uh, these ensemble mean of these metrics by the ratio of the global warming trends to observations. Um, uh, yeah, the, the ratio of observations to the model trends and the global annual mean uh, 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 temperature trend. Um, there's, there's other ways you could do this. We could also just uh, 
select the models that happen to get the, the uh, global mean temperature trend uh, correct, and we get basically the same answers. Um, and so we, uh, if we focus on this 1990 to 2022 period, because uh, this is when this apparent increase in cold extremes uh, occurred, uh, but we also look at the you know, trend starting in 1971, 1971. Uh, for some longer term context, and it's not that the exact start date doesn't really matter. I'm only looking at land only and from 30 to 60 north. All right. So for some results, um, so here uh, I'm showing these two metrics: uh, the ob the observations from AR5 in black. So on the left is this TMN. So we see a clear warming of the coldest days. So reduce reducing the intensity of cold extremes, um, and then the right is that. Uh, TM five pieces of the frequency, and you see a very clear decrease in the intensity of cold extremes over the latitudes. Um, and then the blue, the blue line is showing the uh, multi-model uh, mean, uh, as well as the, the 2.5 97 range in the shading. This is this rescaled model data. Um, and we see that the observations are fit well within the model distribution. Um, with only like a few points kind of outside the model spread, which is expected. Um, we do see some kind of decadal variability, but again, it's everything's within kind of the model spread. Um, and it's also important to point out that I'm going to be showing some trends that start in 1990, and this is a somewhat uh, cherry-picked start date, uh, as there's this, this is a period that was saw uh, which sees quite warm temperatures and reduced cold extremes compared to the previous decades. Um, so another way of plotting this is just with uh, instead of going against time, we do it. We plot these cold extremes against the global mean temperature anomaly. This is not any rescaling. There's no rescaling down here. This is the raw data. And we see that for both these metrics, we see uh, you know, a reduction in frequency and intensity of cold extremes uh, with global warming. And the observations in black fit well within the model distributions um, in, in the blue. And we don't show you any evidence of a model observation discrepancy. Um, so here, we're comparing the magnitude of the observed trends um, in black to the distribution from these 300 uh, realizations, starting with the long-term trends from 1971. We see the observations fit right in the middle of the distribution. And then the bottom plot is uh, showing uh, the uh, observed trends since 1990, so the shorter, tre shorter term trends. And we see that the observed trends are within the model distribution, although they slightly shifted from the, the, the mean of the ensemble. So about 30% of the ensemble members show and weaker trends for the uh, in this TMN metric, for example, and the magnitude of these observed trends over the shorter period are the same as the magnitude, or both the same as the magnitude of the longer term trends, um, and they're quite a bit larger than the global mean temperature trend as well as the winter mean uh, temperature trend. So there's some evidence for some reduction of variability, which has been previously pointed out. Um, and we can also cherry pick the start and end dates to find the most extreme trends. Um, so the top is showing this uh, period from 1990 to 2013, which saw basically no change in cold streams. And these are still within the distribution, although, of course, more on the extreme end. And we can also find uh, trends of the same length, but are on the opposite end of the distribution. So this earlier period, which saw some very strong trends. And these are still within the distribution, but again, on the extreme end. Um, and we can also look at this where look at the impact of increasing the trend length. For search, these are showing the magnitude of the trends um, starting in 1971 as a function of end year. Um, so in black is the observations, and again, in blue is the, the model and the model spread. And we see that this trend started off on the started off on like the higher end of the distribution, and this period where we saw like some leveling off of the the the, the, uh, the time series, uh, we see that the observations kind of converged more towards the, mod the multi model mean. Again, we don't really see any evidence of discrepancy. All right, so how can we kind of reconcile this decrease in intensity that I we found? So I'm just repeating the same plot I showed a few slides ago, showing a warming of the cold extremes of the mid latitudes with this previous uh, plot from this Cornadal paper, which shows a very clear decrease in temperature. So the plot on the left that we show, we find uh, we do see strong warming. There's maybe a level, bit of a leveling off from about 1990s to the 2010s. We never really see a decrease unless you want to really cherry pick a very short term trend. Um, so, and these aren't the ex exact same metrics, but they're very similar. So I think it was worth trying to, trying to reconcile this. Um, this increase in cold extremes uh, has been kind of used to motivate a lot of studies looking at the, the Arctic making latitude links. And 
Uh, this is the study that's usually cited, and it's the only study. It's the only study that I could find that actually explicitly shows an increase in cold extremes over kind of over the entire mid latitudes. So I think it's worth trying to understand this. Um, so this data came from this uh, uh, G, this uh, GHCN fix uh, uh, average over 2050 north. So he had reproduced this and updated the data where we see this very strong drop in temperature followed by a rapid increase. Um, which to me looked very uh, suspicious. Um, so I dug into it and uh, it's pretty clear that this occurred because of some changing spatial coverage of the data. Um, so here I'm plotting the, this data for this, this TNN metric from just from 1995 in the top or in where there's white, which means there's no data. Um, and then look at the same plot for 2015, we see a reduction in the amount of data, particularly at lower latitudes, which are warmer. Um, so we can plot this, we can kind of plot this change over time, looking at the number of grid points that have data over time, uh, comparing lower latitudes, lower the lower part of the middle latitudes over 20, 40 north in red, compared to 40, 50 north with higher this in, and in purple, we see like a very strong drop in the lower lat in the in the grid number of grid points that have data over the lower latitudes, uh, coinciding with this drop in temperature. Um, and this isn't this isn't an unknown issue in the data description paper. Uh, they talk about this uh, changing data coverage, and they recommend, you know, using masks to kind of uh, to kind of account for this uh, when you're looking at spatial averages and trends and time series. Although that doesn't have appeared to have been done in this Cornell paper. Um, so then we can apply this mask, and we find we apply, like apply a mask where uh, to include only the only grid points where this data coverage over the entire time period, and this decrease in temperature goes away. Um, and then the right, uh, so that was this was on the left and red. And on the right, this is showing, this is showing the uh, the, the comparison of this uh, GH index mass data, out, average over 3060 north, which I think is a better definition of the mid latitudes, compared with the Air Five with the same mask as well as the raw data from Air Five, and they all show warming of the, the coldest days, um, and with similar magnitudes as well. Okay, so. So far, I've only been showing mid latitude averages, but what about the spatial distribution of the trends? Um, so it could be that there's maybe some something hidden in the in the mid latitude average. So here's the the, the, the trends. The top is the air five observations um, of these for the two metrics, and you see strong warming of the cold streams over a lot of the regions, but we also do see some regions where there's cooling or an increase in frequency of cold extremes. Whereas in the multimodal mean, of course, we see just a uniform uh, reduction. So I don't know if, if there's anything special about this. Is is this is this what we would expect um, with, because of with internal variability? Um, so uh, to avoid issues with selection biases, uh, uh, what we've what I've done is I've looked at the, the PDF of the spatial distribution. So I just take the, the the trend at each grid point, aggregate them, and calculate a PDF. Um, so this is the PDF for the the observations um, over 1990 to 2022. Um, of course, we see because there's an overall warming, we do see like a shift relative to the, the, the zero line uh, with, you know, some points showing warming, some very strong warming, but some with the cooling. Um, and of course, we can do this in the models as well, each of the 300 realizations. Um, and this is what we get for these 300 realizations. Um, we see consistent with the model mean, we see a slight, slight shift relative to the multi-model mean uh, in the observations, but it's well within the model distribution. Um, and it's important to point out that, and if you look at the, the model distributions, it's important to point out that every single model realizations, the tail goes past the euro. So every single model realization has some region where there's cooling. So often when we see these cooling trends and observations, we often say, well, it's possible that internal variability can cause that. But this says it's only possible, it's guaranteed that there'll be a cooling trend somewhere over the latitudes over kind of this time period. Um, and we also take this a step uh, Further and look at like the percentage of the mid latitude land that has uh, has cooling. So that's what's plotted here. So we see like in both these metrics, we see a little over 20% of the mid latitude area shows cooling, uh, which is a little higher than what we see um, in the models, but it's still well within the distribution. Um, of course, now we can look at, or of course, this this is this metric isn't really saying much about like where these. Are these cold extremes occurred? We can also look in the models to see where these extreme cold events, where, where these, uh, you know, 
increasing pool events occur, and they can basically occur everywhere over the latitude. So, um, in each grid point, there's maybe like a 10 to 30 percent chance of seeing an increase in cold extremes. Um, trying to have a good look. Um, and I'll skip the last two slides and just say conclusion that the meteorological cold extremes have decreased in intensity and frequency over a recent period of, rock, of rapid Arctic warming in agreement with models. Um, and while some regions show this increase over these decades, the spatial distributions are consistent with the model and general variability on top of this uh, uniform kind of decrease in cold extremes. And overall, we find no evidence of model observation discrepancy. Of course, we can't completely rule out that there's uh, model error somewhere. And, you know, this is, and this is true even over recent decades. And of course, but we do expect that there will be, you know, short term regional increases in cold extremes somewhere. Right? Okay. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thanks uh, organizers for giving me these opportunities and uh, no, thanks for keeping this uh, um, uh, hybrid uh, format. Okay. So um, it's a, actually quite interesting. So I've given talks, you know, using exact topic uh, titles, you know, many times the past years, but all of them is trying to sell the positive side and good side of spear models. So I have to change my slides and uh, change my tone. Hopefully it will work out. So yeah, so the okay. How do I? Yeah, so the reason we focus on the Northeast uh, US region, you know, partially a self-centered uh, reason, but the, the for official uh, reason is that this region has experienced the fastest increase in extreme precipitation in the US in the past few decades. And so we also have seen some uh, many major flooding events uh, in the region just in the past few years. So apparently, these uh, the infrastructures in these regions has not prepared for a warming future climate with more frequent and intensified extreme precipitations. But on the other hand, we also know that uh, simulating or projecting extreme precipitation is still very challenging, and one of the limitation comes from the horizontal of uh, resolutions of climate models we commonly use for future projections are still too close to resolve extreme precipitation events. Okay. Yeah, but um, so in the past decades, now as we are moving on forward to higher resolution models, and the more and the more study have shown that you now higher a model of higher resolution, say a uh, final wave 15 kilometer, can improve the simulations of extreme precipitations. So for example, uh, these uh, figures are from uh, Mike Weiner's papers and the using came to uh, with uh, AGCM experiments. Uh, it has uh, three different resolutions and compare with observation. So this showing the 20 year return value of daily um, precipitation over the US regions. So we can see that models with a uh, two, uh, two degree resolution around 200, now it underestimates the intensity of extreme precipitations. And also the spatial distributions is quite different from the observations. But model with high resolution, like uh, the 50, um, 50 kilometer resolutions that improves the simulation of intensity and the spatial distributions. So uh, at FDL, we have these spear models and spear, one thing about spear is that it has three different horizontal resolutions in its atmosphere and the land components. So different resolutions can use for different purposes. So for example, the 25 kilometer spear high, one of the purpose is to study extreme precipitation events. And also it's nice that we have these one models with three different resolutions. So we can check the uh, effect of horizontal resolutions in simulating extreme precipitations. So the first part of this talk is just to compare the performance of three spear models in simulating extreme precipitation over the Northeast regions. And we only focus on the fall season, that is September to November, because this is the uh, season that this region has seen the most robust trend of extreme precipitations. So uh, one of the most common measures we use to define extreme precipitation is 99 percent higher threshold, so the top one percent of daily precipitations. So a uh, black line here is from the observations, and then we can see this big jump of pre uh, frequency since the 1990s. And the color lines are from the ensemble means of uh, three spear models, and then we also compare to CSM1 large ensemble, which has the same resolutions as spear law, so 100 kilometers. 
So all of these models ensemble mean also showing a gradual uh, increasing trend of extreme precipitation frequency for this region in the past few decades. The problem of using a 99 percentile threshold is that uh, these thresholds are based on the climatology of each model, each uh, data set. So they are all around 1 percent. But the threshold can be very different uh, across different models and the different resolutions. So, for example, model with uh, coarser resolutions, they underestimate the intensity of these thresholds. So, for spear low, uh, it underestimates up to 25%. And uh, for spear high, it can uh, simulate a comparable intensity of the threshold and also some detail of, of um, uh, the spatial distribution compared to um, the observations. So, if we use this 99 percent of threshold to select extreme events, it doesn't really uh, reflect how well these models uh, simulate extreme precipitations in terms of absolute intensity. So, um, why this is, um, could be an issue is that, so for this region, 99 percent of threshold is around 45 to 50 millimeter per depth average across the regions. So top 1 percent means you know, it can range from 50 millimeter per day to 400 millimeter per day, for example. And these two different events are very uh, two very different stories for these regions and for these regions infrastructures. And uh, these kind of information are not reflected from these figures. So one alternative way, so I'm doing the opposite side of things as Karen suggests. So one alter alternative way is to use uh, absolute intensity to select events. So for example, we use 50 millimeter per day and it's close to the uh, 99 percentile threshold for this region. So we can see the uh, frequencies are around 1% you know, in observations and in the 25 to 50 kilometer spear models. But for models with closer resolutions, we see they are starting to underestimate the frequencies. And uh, for very extreme precipitation, for example, we use 150 millimeter per day to select events. So for this region, this is like a hurricane type of events, 99.9 percentile events. Only the 25 kilometer spear high can simulate comparable frequencies uh, compared with uh, observations. So these are some good side uh, of models that you now if we have a higher resolution models, not even core resolving models, just 25 kilometers, we can uh, simulate some very extreme precipitation events. But of course, there are some bad side. If we come back to these figures and they look closely to the time series of a uh, spear high, uh, so yeah, so. That's here's the shedding of the uh, spread of spear has 10 ensemble members. We can see that it didn't really capture the observed uh, variabilities. So, for example, this peak around the year of 2010 and uh, this low frequency period from 1980s to early 1990s. So, uh, since uh, spear median has comparable performance, you know, when we use 50 millimeter per day to select events, so we compare the spreads from spear median's 30 ensemble members. So we can see that the spread of 30 ensemble members can capture much more observed variability, even though the peaks are around 1980s and the 2010s are still outside of the spread, but this you know, is much closer than the uh, spread of spear highs ensemble members. So this result suggests that uh, for uh, extreme precipitation, especially for very extreme precipitations, 10 ensemble members is not enough. We need larger um, ensemble size. So yeah, I'm skipping that. So for the per first part, uh, so we are using uh, the uh, 25 kilometer spear high to check uh, the increasing trend of extreme precipitation over the northeast regions. So um, we've seen that uh, spear high can simulate comparable frequency of extreme precipitation, but now of course we probably still need larger ensemble size. So the next part is, it is natural to ask, what is the physical process behind this uh, increasing trend of extreme precipitation? And uh, second, is this uh, spear high doing reasonable for the right reason or probably for the wrong reasons? So to address this, um, we uh, look into the physical process that uh, 
uh, behind some selected extreme precipitation days. So here is the time series of extreme precipitation days for each year, the frequency of extreme precipitation days for each year from 1959 to 2020 in observations. So we can see that um, extreme precipitation days are more frequent in the later three decades from 1990s to 2020s compared to the early three decades from 1959 to 1989s. So the later period, the total extreme precipitation days is about 40% more frequent in the later three decades. And the differences between these two periods are significant, a statistical significant at 95% confidence levels using bootstrapping method. So we categorize these extreme precipitation days into pure Amazon rivers, tropical cyclone related events and the others. So tropical cyclone related events means now there's a tropical cyclone events, uh, including TCs that already experience a tropical transition process within thousand kilometer of the northeast regions. So we use this thousand kilometer because we know tropical cyclones can send moisture to remote regions will have some interactions with mid latitude systems that cause extreme precipitation in the remote regions. And the pure Amos River means there's an Amos River events over the northeast regions, but at the same time, there's no TC related events within the thousand kilometer of the northeast regions. So we can see that the majority of these extreme precipitation days are accompanied by Amos Rivers or TC related events are nearby. So, in observations for um, pure Amos River uh, extreme precipitation days, we do see more frequent events in the later period, but the difference is not statistically significant. And for TC related extreme precipitation days, in the later three decades, the frequency is about 60% more frequent than the earlier period. And the CCTS related events uh, includes the whole phase of tropical cyclones. We can further separate them into hurricane, the tropical storms, and the extra tropical transitions. And so from here, we can see that the primary uh, contribution to the increasing trend of extreme precipitation is not coming from hurricane and the tropical storms. It's actually coming from the increasing influences from extra tropical transitions to these regions. So then we can apply the same analysis to spear high historical simulations. So uh, for extreme precipitation days, spear high ensembles simulate similar increasing ratios uh, for the later period, um, later three decades versus the early three decades. And uh, for the relative contributions of Amos rivers in the tropical cyclone related events, uh, Spear High also simulate uh, uh, similar uh, contributions compared with the observations. So for pure atmosphere uh, extreme precipitation days, the later period has about 25% more events compared with the earlier periods. And uh, for TC related events, uh, it's about 60% more frequent in the later period compared with the earlier period. So it's you know, quite similar to the observations. So you now, like some smiley face for the model, you know, it can capture some like a relative contribution of these different uh, meteorological factors. But so there's always a but. When we separate into hurricane tropical storms versus extra tropical transitions, we can see that in spear high, the main contribution is actually coming from hurricane and tropical storms. Is um, you can see that um, the frequency of uh, extra tropical transition extreme precipitation days doesn't really change uh, a lot in spear high simulations. So now there's the uh, discrepancies between models and observations. So to address that, uh, we look into the uh, track densities of tropical cyclones in spear highs uh, versus in observations. So top row is for uh, tropical cyclones alone, so excluding extratropical transitions. And for the bottom row is for extratropical transitions only. So for tropical cyclones now compared between observations and the spear highs, there are some discrepancies, but in general, the distributions are more or less similar. So we have these recurring features. Compared with extratropical transitions, in observation, you can see the maximum density is along the north, uh, along the east coast of North America. But in spear high, the whole distribution shifted northeastward. 
So we haven't really looked into the details why this is the case, but our hypothesis is that uh, in Spearheim, uh, tropical cycles may uh, experience the extratropical transition process later than they do in observations. So that's why we see this distribution shift to the northeastward. So, yeah, so twist the bed side into a uh, pesticide a little bit. So spear has still can be a, a useful tool to study the change of extreme precipitation if we just aggregate tropical cycles and the extra tropical transitions together as TC related events. Yeah, so just a very quick summary. So we use uh, this uh, 25 kilometer fully coupled spear high to study the long term change of extreme precipitation over the northeast regions. So it seems like uh, this model can simulate comparable frequencies and the relative contribution of different processes to the extreme precipitations, but we still need you no know, larger ensemble sets to you know, capture the internal variability in observations. So, yeah, so I'm leaving this here. So, thank you. Great. Thanks. And yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks to the organizers and also Clivar. Uh, I'm, I really like these workshops. So, I put up uh, our logo from our large ensemble workshop uh, in 2019, so a while ago. I did update it, I added observations. Um, <laughs> So we can start to talk about what matches and what doesn't. This is global temperature, I think. Uh, and actually, I'm going to talk. I'm going to actually try to bring it to much more local scales. Uh, talking about yeah problems in in the Western U.S. with regards to water management and how climate models are used today, uh, and the kind of how people try to yeah account for model observation biases and differences in that process and where we can maybe make progress. Uh, yeah, we're in Boulder, so maybe this can be relatively brief, but fundamentally, as a backdrop to this, uh, this work, the Western U.S. relies heavily on the Colorado River, which has the two largest reservoirs on it. Uh, they kind of allow agriculture to be kind of robust to these drought cycles in the Western U.S., or at least historically that was the case. So there is a significant interest in um, yeah, maintaining that robustness going forward in a changing climate. But that might be challenging with, with increasing droughts. Um, and uh, this is like a plot from a, a recent state of the science report on the Colorado River uh, hydrology and future climate. And uh, these people, yeah, sort of hydrologists and working at this intersection are using temperature and precipitation projections, downscaled or not, from, from GCMs. And they're confronted with some of the same on problems that other people are when they look at regional climate change, there's large uncertainties. So these are temperature and precipitation projections for the Colorado River. I think just for one RCP, RCP 4.5, um, um, but fundamentally, yes, there's a big spread uh, structural uncertainty in there. And I've kind of sort of summarized this with uh, or updated this with CMIP 6 and, and these Hawkins and Sutton type plots when we look at temperature changes over this region. Uh, they, they span a large range. Obviously, a lot of this comes from scenario uncertainty. So I'm also providing uh, these fractional sources of uncertainty that contribute to this. And uh, we see that scenario uncertainty, like in a lot of places, for temperature is, is quite, quite dominant. Uh, for precipitation, the story is quite different, especially with CMIP 6. Uh, scenario uncertainty is almost negligible. Uh, so how much precipitation is going to fall in the region uh, depends, of course, quite a bit more on internal variability, but also response uncertainty or model uh, structural uncertainty. So that's kind of sort of the, 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 the starting point of these two important variables uh, for, for this region. And so I want to talk a little bit about the prospect and caveats of model weighting uh, and, and what people have done to kind of tackle this in, in context of applied science. Um, same report, uh, people have tried to apply to CMIP 5 and 3 different weighting schemes. Uh, the metrics that's shown or the, the, the variable that's shown here is now actual stream flow changes uh, after sort of, yeah, climate change projections have been downscaled and run through a hydrologic model. Different weighting uh, didn't really change the outcome. Uh, the expectation is for less runoff in this region, but a large uncertainty that spans possibilities of increases in runoff and stream flow as well as decreases. And I think a lot of this comes from uh, what historically has been done, I guess, in our community as well as uh, in, 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 in this more applied community, sort of the kitchen sink approach to trying to develop constraints. Um, so this is from a nice paper that like uses order 50 possible metrics to determine whether the models are useful in this region. 
very few of them uh, actually are motivated by constraining the future change signal. So a lot of them are just uh, measuring climatological biases, mean state biases. I'm not saying that those are not useful, but it, often it, what's lacking is showing how they are useful for future projections. And, the, and then unsurprisingly, if you plot them against uh, like the model quality score in this context against um, future changes in precipitation, in this case, there is no correlation. And so I want to touch upon a few things uh, where I, I have sort of very, very uh, modest hopes that we can make progress. Again, first focusing on uh, temperature uncertainty, structural uncertainty in there. Um, I wish I could have updated my or my slides as well this morning because uh, yesterday I learned about Kyle Armour's paper. But anyway, um, and I guess learned about Maria's uh, talk. Uh, there is some evidence that past warming can help us uh, constrain future warming through the relationship in emerging constraints. This is from a paper that focuses on global temperature, but recently there was also work being done uh, by Cosme and Reed uh, showing that, yeah, there's a strong correlation between global and local temperature, perhaps not unsurprising, but they nicely show how you can prog progress a, a global constraint on temperature change to the local scale. Um, and I've looked at this for, for again, for the sort of this, the upper Colorado, Western US region. Um, so we have here a temperature uh, time series of, from observations as well as a large, well, a set of large ensembles. Um, and you can kind of sort of eyeball it already from the left hand side, but on the right hand side, we have the distribution of temperature trends from large ensembles and observations. And in this particular case, yes, models tend to warm more than observations. All the dashed sort of bad models there are where uh, all ensemble members from each or from a given large ensemble are uh, outside of the observations. A very brief intermezzo, just because we had a recent paper on this. There's also work now done on constraining more probabilistically the scenario uncertainty space. I know this is not the focus uh, of this workshop, um, but it's some nice some nice papers uh, by Fran Moore and others. And we've recently tried to actually combine. Uh, some of the more physically motivated constraints with these socioeconomic constraints. Uh, and this again, a, an example of temperature projections for the upper Colorado River, where we kind of apply in a step, stepwise fashion, the scenario uncertainty constraints, as well as the response uncertainty constraints. So fundamentally just which emission scenarios have become less likely as we sort of learn something about socioeconomic trajectories, combining that with uh, these more emerging constraint motivated uh, uh, papers. And so what we find uh, for this region and a couple of others is that we can actually reduce the full uncertainty, so to say, convoluted structural uncertainty as well as emission scenario uncertainty by quite a bit uh, if we if we follow the latest literature. So of course this is still uh, a bit uh, debated and we put out a, a perspective paper last year in AGU advances on this. When we uh, turn to precipitation, as we all kind of anticipate, it's a bit more difficult. Uh, the significant uncertainty source there is the response uncertainty, structural uncertainty for models. And indeed, sort of at first glance for this region, the observations kind of fall within uh, this collection of large ensembles. I will, I do want to point out that this temperature trend looks like, I don't know if I have a cursor here, looks like it's kind of boring, but I will point out that this decline from the 80s uh, to the 2000s and so forth, that has had significant consequences, like uh, so drought, water shortages that people have been faced with in the Western US there uh, to a significant amount a consequence of this seemingly modest downward trend in this in this period. But over this longer time period, uh, there's not a strong trend and uh, it sits within the models. So that's not initially informative. There's a nice recent paper by, by Kevin Grice that, um, that I want to highlight here, where uh, again, a bit more motivated by, by dynamics uh, there is like a modest correlation in winter and in summer between a metric of uh, geopotential height climatologies and the, temp uh, the precipitation trend. Uh, and in that, so that the key result, if I understood correctly, was that uh, the models with the most extreme winter drying, uh, as well as summer wetting, are considered less realistic. So in a way, it brings in uh, the, the structural uncertainty from, from, from its tails, um, if you will, when it comes to future projections. Uh, then if we focus on, there's maybe a little bit of information in, in, in shorter, more recent trends that have experienced more uh, stronger forcing. So it's a recent paper by my grad student where we looked at this decline in precipitation from the 1980s to today that I mentioned. And we focused, thanks to 
uh, we can abbreviate this introduction of low frequency pattern analysis that you already did from, from Rob Wilson's nice paper. We did an analysis of the low frequency pattern uh, of sea surface temperatures and how that relates to precipitation over the Western US. Uh, and so in observations, this is um, the most important pattern, so to say, for Western US precipitation declines is the second uh, low frequency pattern in, in Pacific SSTs. It's actually nicely captured uh, in CSM2, a large ensemble as one example model. Uh, but we already see kind of that the regression onto precipitation, so the consequence of this uh, seems somewhat muted. Of course, you could argue there's internal variability in the left one and it smoothed out in the middle one. Uh, but it was interesting for us to see that um, in the aerosol only simulations, we kind of are getting closer to the magnitude uh, and, and structure of what we see in the observations. Um, so there's p potentially a, a role for aerosols in this, and there's also a, a potential for a discrepancy in the sensitivity to aerosols between observations and, and the model. And I think it's a little nicer or simpler here where we have on the x-axis, again, this SST trend of the second most important low frequency pattern, and on the y-axis, the associated precipitation trend over the southwestern US where we see that the model is really structuring to get, uh, st struggling to get close to this observational value. And again, if we just look at the aerosol only uh, simulations, that, that relationship is a little more where we think it should be. It's, it's a bit circumstantial, but again, maybe there's some, something to learn there with regards to regional precipitation trends uh, moving forward. And then finally, sort of trying to bring these two things together, temperature and precipitation. Uh, I wanna talk about a few ideas from recent papers in the compound event literature, <clears throat> where again, when you think about drought, it's obviously important how both temperature and precipitation change together. Uh, in a given region, and we had a paper with sort of a suggested set of tests uh, for the fit for purpose for, for these kind of questions. And the one I want to highlight here um, is uh, basically just a correlation between the trend of temperature and precipitation, where again, for our target region here, we see that the observed um, correlation down here over the like a 73 year period uh, is quite a bit stronger than most models. Again, uh, once the models do not never capture that kind of value, they have a dashed, uh, dashed um, line. And so only like half of these large ensembles that we looked at kind of are able to capture that and it sits at the end. So models tend to, not all, but tend to have a weak correlation, two weak correlation between temperature uh, and precipitation. And we also see that the models all suggest that this link should get stronger with climate change moving forward. Um, not, not dramatically so, but um, there's something there. So again, understanding the underlying processes and why models get this and not would be helpful. Um, the paper, uh, yeah, together with Jakob Cheisler here, uh, we have again, sort of a set of uh, metrics. I have only kind of talked now about this correlation and the trends. There's two others that get a little bit more at, I think what Karen uh, was talking about, sort of distributional characteristics. Um, and I've colored for these 13 large ensembles um, for these five tests, if they pass it with green and if they don't pass it with red. Uh, and so fundamentally, we don't have any single model that passes all of these tests. Uh, so we could also stop our work there, but uh, I think maybe more pertinent, uh, and that's definitely being done in the practitioner's community is trying to come up with model weighting schemes. Um, and I'm gonna probably move relatively quickly in the interest of time and because it's relatively preliminary work, but I've tried to basically pull together a lot of these constraints that I mentioned, which I feel are a little bit more motivated by actually trying to constrain trends uh, and future projections than what's been done historically in the literature and come up with like a weighting scheme uh, for precipitation and temperature over this particular region. And the application, I'm not gonna go through the details, mostly because I'm really sort of in the midst of trying to do this properly, but the application I wanna kind of walk you through is a simple, uh, water balance model model that's been uh, used already yeah over 10 years ago by colleagues actually from here in boulder Cho Pasuli and chef lucas um just to kind of illustrate how temperature and precipitation can affect reservoir uh levels and so the, the structure of a model like that is really simple we have precipitation and temperature uh, either downscale from climate models or taken directly uh they uh through a precipitation sensitivity a temperature sensitivity affect how much runoff can be expected from them that's fed in a reservoir model that also responds to, to other environmental factors. 
I had put in this highlight slide, but now I realize Hanjun's poster was already yesterday, but he's like looking in detail basically at, at this run of sensitivity and climate models. Um, and so, yeah, if you didn't catch his poster, but you're interested in it, uh, you can find them at the conference. Um, very briefly, uh, as sort of a second to last slide, I think uh, such a reservoir model actually does quite well. Uh, we have the actually observed reservoir level for these two reservoirs. Um, in, in red over the historical period, you can kind of see the crisis unfolding there over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, and then in black, we have the output from our reservoir model when we feed it with observed precipitation and temperature. So it captures a lot of these ups and downs uh, that we have there. And then in the back, we have basically sort of a density map of all these large ensembles, uh, plus a couple of CMIP, uh, additional CMIP um, simulations uh, that kind of show you where these traces fall. Um, there's a lot on there. I, I just want to sort of summarize it. Ultimately, what I think people care about is the risk to fall below a certain threshold in a reservoir. Uh, I've chosen here 20%. And if you then look at our uh, project projections here, taking CMIP 6 and these large ensembles at face value, we have this uh, increase of risk of falling below 20% reservoir level going forward. Uh, if we apply the constraints that I mentioned, um, this gets reduced a little bit, but it's still uh, sizable, I would say, like a risk of falling below 20% of, uh, yeah, of 30% is uh, still a bit concerning. Um, but that's kind of a pathway, I think, that the community, the applied community is already going down. And so all the work we do here, uh, trying to connect it to them, uh, so they use really the latest, uh, uh, yeah, tools as well as are aware of our concerns, uh, I think is important. Okay, I'll leave it at that. I think that's kind of the main points, there's progress on constraining regional climate change, but also huge caveats, um, and it starts all the way at global temperature uh, and goes all the way down. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I ask, can I ask the, the speakers to come up and sit here in front, maybe? And then we start to take questions first from the room. There's microphones. It's easy to see. Go find it. No, no, no. Oh, you want to just move? Oh, Alicia's there. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess it's. No? I'm amplifying myself, so I'm. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I guess I don't know if this is to Karen specifically or maybe more general question and maybe more almost comment. Um, so nobody really talked about ocean extremes so much. Uh, we study uh, marine heat waves, and there are two two issues in marine heat waves which may also be relevant in the context of, of uh, land extremes. Uh, one is that. Um, to the extent that the trend is nonlinear, uh, some aspect of the trend can appear to get folded into variations of extremes. So, if you have a nonlinear trend, uh, then depending upon what your baseline is when you're looking at a PDF, the PDF, if the trend is accelerating, which is the case, PDF will appear to widen uh, over time, and so it'll appear that there is uh, an increased variance. But that's actually the trend component, essentially a difference between a linear and a, and a nonlinear trend line. And so again, how you define these things can really matter. And that can, can make things confusing in general if you're not sure if you're looking at a mean trend or a change in, in variance. Uh, of course, in general, there's always that question that the PDF could, could not just be skewed, curtosed, being shifted by the mean, but it could also be getting broader or narrower. So that's, I guess that's maybe more of a comment. The other more of a question is I noticed that uh, I didn't really hear too much about duration of extremes in, in, in any other talks. And that often is a really important component as well. It's not just, you know, hitting a high value, but, but how long you, you're exceeding some threshold. Marine heat waves is a, is a case in point. Uh, the longer the, the extreme goes on, and the more of an impact it can have on fisheries and uh, things along those lines. 
So I don't know. I was just wondering in general, has anybody been thinking more in terms of duration or is, are you just basically looking at kind of the value trying to ask how often you hit a certain certain value? Uh, yeah. Oh. Cool. Um, yeah, I actually have a response to both of those, even though the first was comments. Um, so I'm glad you made that comment because that's actually been another huge issue when looking at the literature is that when people are saying, yeah, we compare the PDF of 1980 to 2010 to the PDF of 2070 to 2099, you know, the, there's certainly a, a greater nonlinearity in the trend in that future period, almost without a doubt. And so differences in variance, I think, are impossible to infer from those comparisons without doing the analysis yourself. Um, I didn't talk about it extensively in, in my talk, but um, if you were paying attention, you actually noticed that how we defined that kind of amplification metric initially was the difference between the sample max for a year and the sample median. And that was motivated by exactly this issue that knowing exactly what the force trend in the median or the mean is, it's very complicated. Uh, and and um, you know, it's like you would, because you actually would need to know locally everything we want to know, which is what's the force trend in, uh, from greenhouse gases, from aerosols, from volcanoes. And if you make the wrong decision about that parametric form for the trend in the mean, you'll get weird things from the trends of the extremes, just in the way you're talking about. So, um, yeah, I think it's a well-made point, and it's actually, it totally motivated that methodology, because I realized that I did not have the ability to confidently and parametrically say, this is the trend in the mean, and I'll compare the trends in extreme. So that's what motivated that fully non-parametric metric. Uh, and then the second question was about duration. Um, I, 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 I think duration gets complicated because it, uh, the most maybe classic way to think about duration is you, how many days you have beyond a certain threshold and you count the peak extremes. Um, if you make everything warmer, you you automatically have longer durations. And so if you cared about impact specifically, I think that's still totally relevant because you might want to tell a city, yeah, you have X number of days that are longer than, uh, you know, a week or greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever the metric is. But I think from the science side, and this is where there's this interesting like science versus public facing science stress maybe or conflict uh, tension uh, is that that metric has the same issue that I talked about in my talk, that that's going to be, it, it doesn't kind of clarify what exactly is going on. Like, do you have more hot days because just the mean is getting warmer? And that's kind of an obvious answer. Do you have more hot days because you're amplifying hottest temperatures? Uh, and then again, that impacts is attached about the non-normality. So I will say in this work, I initially was also looking at AR1 coefficients. It's just a metric for persistence. Um, and uh, the Northern Hemisphere, you don't see any change in those. Uh, in the southern hemisphere and in the tropics, you see actually a decrease in persistence that's not captured in climate models. Um, so I think that to me, looking at things like AR1 coefficients are probably the best, uh, the most clear way forward scientifically. But from an impacts perspective, I, I do think these other metrics might still be helpful as long as you think about them as being an impact relevant metric and acknowledge that you know, maybe scientifically they're not informing as much because there's a lot of there's a lot of processes going into some you know, county heat wave days over a threshold. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I guess just to, to, to add to that. So there's, uh, again, on, in terms of marine heat waves, there is a, uh, a perspective article, I think, uh, in trial of your class classification in nature uh, by my et al. Uh, kind of dealing with this issue for marine heat waves. Should we be defining marine heat waves relative to a fixed baseline, in which case, like you say, everything's getting warmer and it's more persistent, or should we be defining it relative to some sort of trend line? In which case, you know, again, uh, in this uh, Shu et al. study that two of us were involved in, there doesn't seem to be any change in SST variance almost anywhere in the globe once you take out a nonlinear trend. And they're both, there's a, it's a big controversy in that field. There's a lot of intense feelings on both sides. But I, I think it's probably relevant, not just for marine heat waves, it's gonna be relevant for any of these kind of questions about extremes. And you could argue pretty easily for both, in both directions. So it's just probably worth keeping that in mind. Okay, thank you very much. I think we move on to the next question. The same type table. Call, call. Uh, so the first one is a comment. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk yesterday and today, and I wish uh, the Guardian and New York Times reporters listened to the Maroon talk and uh, 
Blackboard stock and also Acumen stock, we may change the headline slightly. Um, but I mean, the, the recent headlines about models completely failed to predict XYZ extreme. Uh, we're talking about several of those here today. My actual question is about uh, the size of an ensemble. I think it's going to be relevant to the discussion later today. Um, when, when someone asks me the question, uh, I just say a thousand is overkill. Three or four, maybe too little, maybe 50 is okay. I think there was one paper which said 50 is a good number. And uh, a talk today said 10 is too little, 30 may be enough. But uh, given in McKinnon's talk that um, the model tail may be different from the observed tail, is it really worth 3,000 members to get the wrong tail correctly? <laughs> um, so I, I think an ensemble size is something we may have to decide on for a protocol on how to. Decide if effect streams are significant. Any, does, it, does anyone want to comment on this? It's on some slides where we should go. Just to. I, I was still mind that bringing up ensemble size. So, um, so I'm not really working on model developing, so I don't really know how to, you know, to um, shed uh, the trade off between like. For example, there's also like an argument in not argument like discussion in GFT or like the the trade off between uh, model resolutions and the uh, ensemble size, and uh, but also you now just from the talks, you now we know that you now also there's a possibility that the model is wrong. So even you have a thousand, you, know, you have a really large ensemble size, you know, it just really makes sense because the like the every ensemble may be wrong. So I don't really have a good question, a good answer for that. I think I'll probably probably I'll have a better comment for that, but yeah. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add. I mean, fundamentally it depends on what you care about. Um, if you want to chase very small signals, you need a large ensemble. And then it becomes a philosophical question if you that's a good use of your resources, right? Um, I mean, there's like a sort of statistical estimates how many ensemble members you need to get a certain signal. Um, and there's, we can probably make some recommendations later today for a couple of met metrics and variables we talk about in this workshop, but fundamentally, I think it's almost a philosophical discussion. I think maybe I can just comment yeah. on that. Um, it just occurs to me maybe a good way forward. As you say, if the models aren't producing the right distributions, there's no point making future projections with them. So maybe we should just focus on historical simulations, or at least when we think the period when we have good observations, and then run, you know, 30 members. If we can say that the models are, you know, replicating the observed distribution, then there is merit in doing their future um, scenario projections. But if they're not, then don't bother, something like that. And just one quick final point is that this comes, it's basically a resource question, right? If we have infinite resources, which is run everything, let us call high risk, <laughs> models, let's just do it all. Um, so I think this is also a case where um, statistical artificial intelligence methods probably should be utilized more specifically for producing synthetic ensembles. Um, you know, there's the observational large ensemble work that I did with a very, very basic statistical model, but, you know, I think approaches like that can be advanced for sure. Um, and so I think that if we're, you know, if we want to get those samples, you know, trying to more leverage not as computationally intense models could be advantageous. Okay, then we have a question in the back. Um, well, Kate Willett had a good comment hey. in the chat, and I wanted to um, give her the opportunity um, to voice that. So, Kate, if you want to unmute. Kate, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um... Yeah, so it was it was a really good talk, and I think I'm going to have to listen to it again to to get some of the methodology. But um, so I work on an extremes data set looking at humid extremes. So I look at the indices in the wet bulb temperature rather than the, temp the dry bulb temperature, and so I do use some of these metrics of days exceeding thresholds. And um, 
And so I take to heart what you've said, and I think actually we do need to be really careful how we use these and how we communicate them. But there is value for um, in terms of risk and impact on society. So I think these sorts of thresholds still have a place and they are useful, but I absolutely take your point that we need to be quite cautious on how we use them. Yeah, and I'll just, I, I agree totally. I think it's, it's again, this kind of tension between what's the, what's the goal of the modeling? Is it to, to as clear as possible, understand what the system is doing, or is it to provide information to society, or is it both? And I think that that is a challenge that we run into. Um, and so I was probably being, of course, provocative in my statement, because I understand that these impact relevant metrics, things, they do matter in terms of days exceeding thresholds and stuff, but I, yeah, let's just be clear about kind of what we're doing and, and what might be built into to those metrics. Maybe also a bit from the online after Russell's talk of the oh my, there was a quite a discussion going on about the slight frustration expressed on the observation availability. So perhaps some people said, okay, this is a real problem if the coverage goes so far down. I mean, maybe to all of you, how much are you limited by observation of availability and maybe how how much can we fill in with with uh, reanalysis? I mean, earlier on it was like reanalysis are not for extremes, and can we learn something about the trends already now? And, And so that that data set that had that coverage issue, like that just one data set um, that has this issue, that I'm sure we, all kinds of data sets also have this issue as well. Um, there's also like a Berkeley Earth has like a daily uh, daily temperature data set. I don't know how it's still like this is experimental, so I don't know. Uh, I've used it quite a bit. It seems to agree pretty well with reanalysis, I mean, just like full complete coverage. Um, but yeah, and other than that, I use I tend to use kind of all these real analysis products not, but I, it's certainly a challenge and I'm not sure if there's a good answer to how we how we deal with this issue. Yeah, um, yeah I I used to be really skeptical of reanalysis temperature, but Gary 5 I actually think has been quite good. <laughs> um, but I will say one interesting thing. So I initially wanted to do all of these analyses I showed you guys for both TXX and TXN, so daily minimum temperature. Um, because we're looking at max versus median, I could only compare to station data that has a lot of years that have full, you know, every summer day type of coverage. That basically gets you down to the US, Western Europe, and Australia. You <laughs> the whole rest of the world. So this is a very limited comparison. But it was interesting. So for TXX, ERA and the observations agreed pretty well. I mean, there was spread, obviously, you're comparing a point and a grid, so you expect that, but there wasn't a bias. But that wasn't true for TXN. TXN trends looked pretty different when we looked at how these tails versus the median uh, compared. And so I didn't end up pursuing kind of that half of the paper because I was just like, oh, I don't know if I trust ERA 5 anymore and I don't want to go down this road. So. Um, even though I do think greenhouses are, especially ERA 5, are much better for temperature now than they used to be, um, I always, I think it's always nice when you can to go back to those in-situ observations with the note that they have their own issues, which is another long conversation, um, but it's, I think it's good to always, you know, think about can you, how much information can you collectively bring together to make sure you're getting a consistent result. Thank you. I mean, one, one suggestion online was that we, we as a climate modeling community are more vocal about the need for making these observational um, products available and, and actually also fund the continuing uh, monitoring, which is very cost consuming. Uh, but we had a I think Tiffany. Yeah. Um, great set of talks. And I think one of the takeaways I got from the two temperature stream talks, summer is not the same as winter, maybe, but of course, maybe you weren't looking at the same regions. So for me, even if the model does get a does do a good job. I want to make sure we should want to make sure that it's doing it for the right reasons. And in summertime, there's been some suggestion that we need to kind of disentangle thermodynamic from dynamic, which is not a perfect way to disentangle things. And that's quite a clear approach for precipitation extremes. You know, Paul Gorman's work has given us a way to do that. And I guess I'd like to get your thoughts on how that could be advanced for temperature extremes because. You know, one could imagine the possibility, especially in winter, that dynamics is really important, but can we demonstrate that? Is there a quantitative way to show and then, you know, make sure models are capturing those components properly? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't, I'm not sure if that has been uh, 
I've gotten for the winter temperatures. I know the, for the summer that was the paper that you mentioned, uh, Bob's book hard and all, they, they did some, something like that, some kind of uh, generic adjustment like this. So I don't know if it's been done kind of uh, comparing, uh, trying to like, you know, break it down, break the winter time tree coverage down into, you know, uh, dynamic or aerodynamic. But I do know that uh, the trends do tend to be for like weak in circulation. Um, so I suspect that at least in examples like observed transit and model trends, that it is primarily thermodynamics. So we do understand that thermodynamics will just be warming as well as the, uh, the effects of Arctic amplification on the warming of the cold streams, like reducing variability because of the reduced temperature gradient. That's, you see that in, in models and observations. But the circulation trends tend to be quite weak, so I suspect that there would be uh, kind of weak uh, trend related circulation. But I don't think that has that has been done. But it's certainly sort of like a useful exercise to do it. Yeah, it seems like the places where you weren't seeing the trend, positive trend. Yeah, like there were discrepancies in your plots that you can yeah, over yeah, Asia. Yeah, over yeah, over Asia. Yeah, I it's suspect amazing. that that is that it, that is related to the circulation. So I don't know if there's like been an exact like quantitative. You know, calculation to do that, but yeah, certainly very useful. Okay, we take one last question by Kai and then we break. Yeah, thanks uh, for these really interesting and uh, nice talks. I must say I'm uh, positively surprised actually by how well extremes are represented apparently in, in models. Like, I didn't expect such a positive outcome, uh, in particular at this session. Um, so I was I was wondering what what the panelists think about um, maybe adding more dimensions to the types of extremes that, that we're looking at and um, maybe also guided by like what is causing the most impacts in agriculture and uh, supply change um, the chains uh, globally by basically looking into consecutive extremes and uh, globally concurrent extremes more and like um, checking drivers on the statistics and models. Yeah, as you, as you can expect them, um, it supported that. I, I, I straddle kind of to get the, uh, what feels like the core group of talks and expertise we've seen here, and then some of these more applied questions, and I think so do you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of that, of going out into 12 and learning what uh, metrics might people actually care about. At the end, I think the fundamentals that we talk about here are super important, and I mean, I keep going back to Maria's talk yesterday, right? To kind of questions everything coming after global temperature. <laughs> so yeah, I think this community has a real opportunity here to be a, a voice of reason, but also go out and listen to what, what people uh, at the end you know, can just support what you've said. Okay, I think it's time we break here uh, for coffee and let's thanks to all the speakers again. Thanks. Um, so now we're going on to a, a series of talks about the role of force trends versus internal variability and how do we kind of distinguish those um, over the historical record. So our first speaker um, is an invited talk and that's by Jeremy Clavens. All right. Uh, thank you all for having me today and thank you for the organizers for uh, being so adaptable and getting us in this room in person. Uh, today, I'm presenting some work along with a whole bunch of collaborators who have really helped my thinking on uh, the signal to noise error in decadal climate modes. Uh, and so, you know, for the last day and a half, uh, I think we've been a little rough on climate models. Uh, you know, we've been pretty critical of them. And, and so I think I'm a little worried that they've become underconfident. And that's what I'm going to talk about today is our models underconfident. And so I've kind of organized this talk as a way to to build them back up. And so this is a, a kind of complement sandwich. Uh, we're gonna first start with what models are doing well, uh, and then we're gonna focus on what they can improve on. Uh, and we're gonna finish up with if they take some of the steps to improve, uh, what, can, what can we learn from them as they get better? And so I'm gonna start with, uh, with a focus on these decadal modes. Uh, we're gonna be looking at the AMV, NAO, and PDO as examples, and we're also gonna be looking at some of their impacts. And overall, I think maybe this is a low bar, but models produce internal modes of variability. 
Uh, they look somewhat like observations. So this is an example of the AMV. The observed pattern is in the top left, and I'm defining the index as just the linearly detrended uh, area average sea surface temperature in the North Atlantic. This is just the regression of sea surface temperature and sea level pressure on that index. Uh, observations are the top left, pre-industrial control runs are on the bottom, and the uh, fully coupled uh, historical runs are in the top right. Uh, you don't have to squint too hard to see that that looks like the AMV. Um, kind of similar story for the NAO. This is the first EOF of sea level pressure in the North Atlantic. Um, they have a similar spatial pattern. Uh, they explain similar amounts of uh, variance uh, between models and observations. You might have small complaints like the centers of action that are slightly displaced, but overall, it's models are producing something that look like an NAO. And finally, models can produce something like a PDO. Uh, observations are on the left, and a model is on the right. Uh, they're not always perfect, but they can produce something that looks a lot like the observed PDO. Uh, so, you know, models good for you. You can do something like observations. We're really happy about that. Uh, these modes are also associated in models with impacts that look somewhat like the real world. So, for example, with the AMV, we see that if you regress precipitation onto the AMV index, you get a uh, Sahel rainfall signal, something that we'd like to see. Uh, similarly, for the NAO, you get something that looks like the right precipitation trends over Europe. Uh, and for the PDO, uh, as Fabio already pointed out today, you kind of get a connection to rainfall in the Western US. Um, so good job models. Uh, we're kind of getting something like observations. Uh, now, what are they? what are they struggling with a little bit? We find that pretty consistently observed decadal variances are on the edge or on the outside of the distribution of the ensemble spread. So a kind of first example of that is the AMV index. Observations are on the plot in the pink horizontal lines there. Uh, and the black bars are pre-industrial control runs that have just been bootstrapped to give you a range of variances. Uh, the open circles are individual ensemble members from a bunch of different ensembles. Uh, and the CSM large ensemble, CSM one large ensemble is on the right in the red circles, and the ensemble means are the filled variances. And you can see that almost all the time, but not all the time, most of the time, observations are kind of at the edge of the spread produced by models. Um, so we're saying it's kind of unlikely uh, that models are producing or that observations uh, are in this ensemble spread. But that's just one index. Uh, you can probably guess that for some of the AMV variances, we're going to get a similar story. Uh, this is from some work by Chang Fei, who's here. Um, the distribution from CMIP 5 and 6 large ensembles uh, are in the gray uh, distribution there, and observations are in the red. And again, we see that the observations are kind of towards the edge of what models can produce. Uh, same thing happens with vertical wind shear uh, in the main development region of the North Atlantic. Uh, I'm a Floridian, boo. Um, and so we really care about that sort of thing. Um, finally, I'm just going to run through these pretty quickly. If you look at the NAO index, that's in the, the observed NAO index is in black. Uh, you can kind of see by eye that the variance of the observed NAO index is bigger than we'd see from the ensemble spread, which is in the red cloud. And that's from a really large decadal prediction system. Uh, same story holds for a major NAO impact, which is Northern European precipitation. That's on the bottom plot there uh, from the same set of models. That variance in observation seems to be higher than anything models are producing. And finally, we see the same thing for a PDO impact. Uh, so this is, seems to be really consistent, not just in the Atlantic, but across the globe, or at least in the extra tropics that observations, which are the black horizontal line at the bottom of the plot, seem to be at the very edge of the spread produced by models. It looks like one member of CESM produces a drying trend in the Western US that looks like observations. So I'm going to argue here that this is a kind of systematic error. Um, I think there's kind of two options. Either we live at the edge of this distribution, that the world has been kind of weird, um, and I think that would take you believing the world is really weird to take that approach, or there's a problem with models. Uh, and as we've seen today, there are plenty of problems with models that we can improve. Uh, so if there's a problem with models, uh, I think either models are underestimating internal variability, that is the ensemble spread is too narrow, 
those distributions I showed earlier should be wider uh, and maybe encompass observations more often, or models are underestimating the response to external forcing. That is, these distributions should be shifted, and maybe more often observations should be falling somewhere else within this distribution. Um, as you can probably guess from the rest of these talks, uh, and from this kind of dichotomy, internal versus external forcing, we're going to be using a lot of different large ensembles to examine these questions and try to make the case uh, that the amplitude of the force response is too weak in models. So I'm going to start back with the AMV. Uh, we find a really kind of consistent result across all of these modes, which is that the ensemble mean index is highly correlated with observations, or at least more highly correlated with observations uh, than we would have previously expected. So here, uh, observations are in black, and the red lines are the CESM1 ensemble. The thick red line is the ensemble mean AMG index from CESM1. You can kind of see by I, it's highly correlated. The R square is around 0.75. That holds up in a bunch of different large ensembles once you get over about 10 members or so. Uh, and if you look across uh, all the CMIP5 ensembles, that, that R squared is, is right around 0.75. Uh, so that we interpret that to mean that external forcing is playing a significant role in the timing of AMV transitions and impacts. Uh, thank you, PowerPoint. Um, the same thing kind of holds for the NAO. The NAO index here is in black, and the ensemble mean from CMIP5 large ensembles is in red. And we see a reasonably high correlation of R squared of 0.6 between the ensemble mean and the observations after 1960 or so. Um, that's a higher correlation than I would have expected. And I will note here that the ensemble mean has been just rescaled to have the same variance as observations in the top lot. Uh, this kind of holds for NAO impacts too. That's Northern European precipitation on the bottom plot where the ensemble mean is telling us something about what happened in the observations at a level that's higher than I would have expected. And then finally, this isn't just unique to the Atlantic. This happens in the Pacific too. Black is observations. Uh, blue is the PDO index uh, from CMIP5 and CMIP6 large ensembles. So we're looking at like 470 some members. Uh, and we see a pretty good correlation between the PDO index and the ensemble mean and from observations. So again, this is saying something that we think the forced response is important in these in the timing of these decadal modes and the timing of their transitions and the timing of those inflection points you see. I do want to take a second to pause and say these correlations are not one. We're not rolling out a role for internal variability. Uh, internal variability could be really important for the exact timing of some of these shifts that we've seen in observations. If an inflection point changes by five years, either way, that's really important for impacts. Um, you know, these are just high correlations, but you could say, okay, well, maybe internal variability could produce high correlations. Um, and we think that internal variability alone isn't capable uh, or is very, very rarely capable of producing these high correlations. Uh, so this plot here on the left is kind of a 2D histogram of the correlation between on the y-axis, the AMV and vertical wind shear in the main development region, and the AMV and Sahel rainfall on the x-axis. And so in runs without forcing, so these are just historically forced runs with the ensemble mean removed, these two kind of AMV impacts seem to be unrelated. This, these correlations are more or less centered on zero. Uh, so if the AMV and vertical wind shear go together, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that Sahel rainfall is changing too, which is kind of interesting, but observations tell us a different story, uh, they fall outside of what ensembles are producing. Uh, when we add back in the forcing, we see that the distribution kind of shifts towards observations, which is we want these two impacts to move together. Uh, but what's really striking is that in the blue star there is the ensemble mean, the red star is observations. The ensemble mean is kind of right next to observations. That forcing, external forcing, seems to be syncing up uh, these two impacts. In a maybe a little bit more straightforward 1D version of this, we can look at the distribution of correlation coefficients across the CMIP5 and 6 large ensembles uh, in, again, the just internal variability from each ensemble member. 
versus the forced correlation. That's the black bar there. And you see that this forced correlation uh, is only reproduced by like one uh, out of 472 members. Uh, so we think it's unlikely that this high correlation is due to just internal variability. Um, if this is a force signal, if there's a force signal in the PDO, NAO, AMV, and any of these decadal modes, we should see some other evidence for forcing. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm just kind of like run through it like a laundry list. I'm happy to talk more about it later. Uh, but one thing I've, I've always appreciated is that, you know, if forcing is involved here, we should expect that as forcing grows, uh, forcing should play a bigger role in these decadal modes. And so if we start looking at the earlier time periods in our ensemble, and that's the blue bars there starting in either 1850 or 1920, depending on when your large ensemble was initialized, uh, you see that forcing explains less in variance than when we focus on a time period where uh, the climate is more heavily forced. And that's the green bars there, which all start in 1950. And this is for the AMV index. We see similar results for the NAO and PDO indices as well. Uh, single forcing large ensembles, uh, DAMF and, and some of the CESM single forcing runs show similar results, but for time periods where we uh, expect the forcing to be important. Uh, so, for example, if you expect a greenhouse force trend to exist after 1995 in the PDO index, the single forcing large ensembles produce them. Same thing for aerosol force periods. Um, and then finally, the ensemble mean spatial patterns do bear a similarity to the observed spatial patterns of these decadal modes, uh, especially for the AMB, the NAO is okay, and that the PDO has some weaknesses there, but it, it does inspire confidence that we're not looking at something completely random. It's not uh, shifts in like what patterns popping up in EOF, something like that. And so you're probably wondering now, like, Jeremy, you haven't actually done anything that fancy. You're just, you know, making some time series and, uh, and calculating some correlations. Why hasn't this just been very, very obvious? And so this gets to a question from the last session or last session, which is uh, how many ensemble members do you need? And it turns out we need a whole lot of ensemble members to be able to isolate these high correlations between the ensemble mean uh, and observations. The example here is for the PDO index, uh, and all I did here was just bootstrap random ensembles of increasing size on the x-axis and then plot the r-squared on the y-axis. And you can see that as ensemble size increase up to about 100, that correlation starts to finally saturate. So if you have a, a small ensemble, only 40 members or so, you may not get all the way up that curve. You may not be capturing the full um, forced response. And why is that? Uh, I'm going to argue that the amplitude of the force signal is too small and it's been overwhelmed by uh, internal noise. You can imagine if you have a force signal uh, that's too small, you have a lot of internal noise, you're not going to get a correlation until you take a ton of ensemble members to really tamp that down. Um, and because you need a lot of ensemble members, this and this force signal is so weak, it's really easy to overlook. If we've been looking at the CESM1 large ensemble uh, from 1920 to 2005, which is a slightly less force period, especially 1920 to 1950, uh, and only look at 40 ensemble members, we can go back to that bootstrapped uh, version of this and find that on average, uh, we're only getting about a 5% explained variance. If we use all the same metrics and just cut it off in 1950 and use a much, much larger ensemble for the PDO index, uh, we find that 53% explained variance. And so there's kind of two key things here, which is if you're looking for a role of forcing, you need to look at force periods and you need to look at a large enough ensemble. Uh, I'm not picking on this Newman paper on the right. I really like that paper. I've been, I've been trying to make sure I understand how, uh, how the PDO that's presented in that paper uh, can coexist with what we've been thinking about the forced response. And one thing I really appreciate about that paper and kind of the bottom plot there in CSM1 is they did publish that null result. I think that's really cool to be able to build on. Um, anyway, the, so we're kind of arguing that this externally forced signal uh, to internally generated noise ratio in models is too weak. If that sounds familiar, uh, that is a lot like the signal to noise paradox. In fact, I think this is kind of a special case of the signal to noise paradox or a narrowing of it. We're focused on decadal time scales um, and we're using uninitialized large ensembles. So we're just focusing on the, uh, the force component of this. 
uh, when you compare initialized and uninitialized ensembles on decadal timescales, um, I think you find that the uh, most of the predictable signal that the signal to noise paradox papers we're looking at comes from forced variability. Uh, so I think these two results are really consistent and talking about the same error in models. So we've been talking a lot about the signal to noise ratio. Is it too low in models relative to observations? Why don't we just calculate this? Uh, Cheng Fei did a really nice plot of this that kind of summarizes a lot of our work. He has a poster. You should go visit it later. Cheng Fei, do you have supplemental material in your poster? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, so, for large ensembles, which are in the blue bar, uh, we can really easily calculate the signal to noise ratio. We just take the variance of the ensemble mean and divide it by the variance of the internal variability uh, in models. And you get those blue bars, which are very small and sometimes hard to see. For observations, we do a really simple method, and, and maybe Rob can help us uh, with a more comprehensive method for how to estimate the signal to noise ratio in observations. We just do a linear regression and, and back out the signal to noise ratio. And those are in red. And you can see that for all the decadal modes, uh, models are underestimating the signal to noise ratio. Uh, all the way on the right is global mean SST, which is, I think, you know, Maria's talk and a couple other talks that point out is doing okay. So good job models back to that global mean temperature. So a quick summary. Um, what are models doing well? Well, they reproduce uh, decadal modes of variability. They have them in there. Where can models improve? We think the signal to noise ratio in models, particularly the force signal to uh, internally generated noise ratio is too weak. Um, and that's because there's a high correlation between the force signal in and observations. Um, and uh, yeah, that's right. And so what happens? How can we improve the signal to noise ratio? And what could fixing this error teach us? Uh, well, a few people have started to attack this question. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to give credit to them and, and move on since this is an overdue talk. Uh, some people think that ARC coupling is too weak, especially in kind of one degree, two degree resolution models. Uh, some people think that upper ocean damping may be damping temperature variability too much, uh, which would reduce overall variance. Uh, some people think that model resolution could be improved. That's either horizontal resolution or vertical resolution, especially around the tropopause and, and the stratosphere. Uh, and then maybe ocean front resolution. If you have stronger fronts, you can get a stronger atmospheric response to those fronts, and that would improve your signal to noise ratio. Uh, what happens if we could fix this? And, and I think this pairs nicely with some of the work that Flavio presented uh, quickly about aerosols in the western U.S. drought. The blue distribution here is just from those CMIP 5 and CMIP 6 ensembles, those precipita precipitation rates in the Western US, and observations are the black circle. If we just take those same ensemble members and we rescale their signal to noise ratio just statistically, uh, so kind of amping up the ensemble mean and, and keeping variance constant, we find that uh, precipitation rates, the whole distribution kind of shifts over. We're keeping variance constant. I think that's an open question, what we should do with that variance. But we're keeping it, we're shifting it over, and all of a sudden observations, instead of looking like a kind of tail event or, or something that's rare that may switch back, it looks like a kind of expected response uh, to external forcing. And so kind of overall, We think that models may be underestimating climate risk, so risk of drought like that in the, uh, the Western US, while overestimating its uncertainty. Uh, if you look at those distributions and how they shift, if we had originally seen that orange distribution, we would have said, okay, maybe a drought is likely and maybe we can plan for it. Um, and then I think it's an open question about, again, what happens to the variance of this distribution and, and how the risk is, or the uncertainty about this risk is changing. I think that's a good thing for, for us all to be looking at. Um, there is some good news here, which is external forcing is predictable in the near term. Uh, and so we can leverage large ensembles and our, our expectations for external forcing to try and predict near term climate impacts. Um, I think there's a couple other implications, which I'll just do quickly. Victoria Todd and Tim Shanahan are doing some really cool work if you run into them looking at is the climate model response to like solar and orbital forcing in the mid Holocene uh, appropriate in models relative to paleoclimate records? Um, and I mentioned the kind of role of internal variability. How big is it really? Do those distributions need to be wider or smaller, or should they stay the same? 
Uh, but until we can fix this error, I think the good news is we have a really great tool uh, to be looking at this externally for a signal. We just made it need to do a little thinking about the ensemble means more. Uh, so I would encourage you to kind of use these large ensembles, think carefully about the ensemble mean, and think carefully about how large an ensemble you would need to really extract that ensemble mean. So with that, I'll take any questions during the discussion. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Uh, great. So thanks, Jeremy. That was a perfect um, introduction to the signal to noise error, uh, and, and it, it really helps um, to people to understand what I'm going to say now as well. So I'm focusing on the North Atlantic Oscillation, um, and I'm really going to try to assess whether uh, projections of this could be suffering from, from the signal to noise error that, you've, um, that you just highlighted. Okay. So. Um, so, th so this shows uh, observed and modeled trends in U700 uh, winds uh, in the in the left-hand panels and rainfall uh, in the right-hand panels. This is from a paper by Blackboard and, and Five. Um, and, so what, and, and the um, the the crosses there show where uh, the oh, it seems to be okay. It's doing something. Uh, the crosses show where the um, observations are outside the full range of the model ensemble, and there are 303 members in this ensemble. Oh, sorry, I think it's advancing automatically. Can you go back one? Yeah, okay. So what you can see there is that is there's um, a striking increase in, in, in the wind strength um, uh, and, and associated changes in, in rainfall precipitation. Um, but the model patterns have a similar, the, the models have a similar pattern, but a much weaker um, magnitude. And so could this be an example of the signal to noise error? Uh, and, 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 you know, are, are the models underestimating the potential uh, changes that we're seeing in the observations? Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to look at um, the NAO and we're going to look at 31 year rolling means. Um, so the black curve is the observed 31-year rolling mean and the NAO. Uh, and we're going to look at naturally forced simulations, forced only by solar and volcanic variations, because these are a bit easier to understand in the first instance. Um, so what you can see there is, although the variability is, is quite small in these naturally forced simulations, some of them do have significant correlations with the observations. So can ESM5, for example, has a significant positive correlation, 0.47. Um, but other models, such as CNRM CM6, uh, has a significant negative correlation. So uh, these two models have opposite responses. So we need to understand why that is. So next slide, please. So what I'm looking at here is the regression between Earth's energy imbalance, EEI, uh, and zonal mean zonal wind. All, all again done in 31 year rolling means. Uh, and I'm looking at that because the, the climate system will respond to an energy imbalance to bring it back into balance. Uh, so I'm, try I'm trying to look at this response. Uh, so we see a similar pattern in these two models. There's a, a, a kind of N shape band of increasing zonal winds uh, extending down into the troposphere and across the, the, the top of the tropopause. Um, but actually, it's fundamentally different wh where they intersect the surface. So uh, in CAN ESM5, we see a poleward shift of the climatological winds, whereas in CNRM, we see an equatorward shift of the, of the climatological winds. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why might that be? Uh, so now I'm regressing the same thing, as an energy imbalance against zonal mean um, temperature. And so you can see that when we have a positive energy imbalance, we have a warming of the troposphere. Uh, both models are showing this. Uh, and if anything, we get a cooling in the stratosphere. And that creates um, a, a strong uh, gradient in heating at around about 200 hectopascals. Um, but where that gradient occurs relative to the, to, to the climate cycle jet um, is, is fundamentally different in these two models. So, uh, the magenta dot, dot, dot shows the jet centroid, uh, and the green dot shows um, the, uh, a measure of, 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 the, of, of the difference between the, the troposphere and the stratosphere uh, based on water vapour. 
so so we're me measuring water vapor here uh, because that's what can control uh, the heating of, of a, it, it, t it tends to spread out the heating in the troposphere and um, because there's no the, the, there's so little water vapor in the in the stratosphere uh, that's one way of differentiating the, the troposphere from the stratosphere so in Canny SM5, you can see that the magenta dot, the, the jet centroid, um, is equatorward of the, uh, the, this hydropause latitude at 200 hect hectopascals. Uh, so the result of that would be a poleward shift uh, of, of, of the jet uh, in response to this heating. Whereas in CNRM, uh, we get the opposite effect. So the, um, the jet centroid is now poleward, and, and, and the heating occurs on the equatorward side uh, of, of the jet, and that uh, would, would tend to produce an equatorward shift of the jet. Uh, next slide, please. So this gives us potentially um, an, a, some sort of emergent constraint if, if this if this is true across models, and and so what we have here is sixteen uh, models that that uh, provided. Um, this NAT simulations with at least three ensemble members. Uh, and what I'm looking at here is this shift in the jet latitude uh, related to the Earth's energy imbalance. Um, and, and what we find here is a significant correlation across the models, uh, 0.61. Um, and some of the models do in, in, indeed shift equatorward and some and other was shift, shift poleward. Um, and then the next axis is, is this hydro, hydropause latitude relative to the jet. Uh, and I've plotted on there the observations from the swoosh data, and you can see that in the observations, uh, this hydropause high latitude is is further poleward than all of the models, suggesting that in the real world there would be a poleward shift of the jet for a positive energy imbalance, um, and that it, it could be greater than in any of the model simulations. Uh, next slide, please. So we can use that relationship to define um, weights for each indi in, in the individual model based on the ensemble regression technique, um, such that models that, that um, are close to the observations in terms of the high pause latitude relative to the jet receive high, high weights, uh, and, and models that uh, would actually shift the jet in the wrong direction, so equatorward, um, potentially even uh, receive negative weights. And so the, the panels here show the effect of that, um, that emerging con constraint uh, on the simulation. So the left-hand panel just shows the raw model data. Uh, so the, again, the observations, I've put two different observations here to, to look at the uncertainties in the observations. Uh, and the ensemble mean shows very little uh, variability, almost none. Whereas when you um, apply this, um, this emerging constraint, then you start to, well, you, you, you get a significant correlation with the observations now. Um, I should say that uh, the signal to noise ratio is too small, uh, as expected, uh, uh, based on Jeremy's talk and, and, uh, and other evidence. So, we, so I've scaled uh, by the ratio of, of predictable signals, which is about four in this case. Uh, and when you do that, you get the, the, the line on the right hand side of the plot, the yellow line. Uh, so we, we now get a significant correlation, um, suggesting that there is some or could be some role for, for natural forcings. Uh, but note that the minimum uh, it occurs around about 1980, and that's later than the observations. And I'll come back to that later on. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what about if we have all forcings, and 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 indeed if we look at future projections as well. Um, so uh, I've plotted a selection of models here, uh, and, and these are all forced by the SSP 245 scenario. And you can see that some of the models, so Myrock, for example, has a very high correlation uh, with the observations over this historical period. Um, UK ESM also has a high correlation. Um, but if you look at the future, uh, that then, then you know the trends are, are very different in, the, in these different models. So Myrock has pretty much no trend. That's the pink line. Uh, UKSM has a negative trend, and, and GIS E21G has a positive trend. Uh, so clearly these models can't all be right, um, and, and we need to you know to do something about that basically. Okay, next slide, please. 
So, that, so this shows the same um, emergent constraint idea based on the hydropause latitude relative to the jet for each of these uh, different model simulations now. So the, these are the historical uh, simulations, uh, and, and I've had to detrend uh, uh, the the the, um, the energy imbalance to, to to get this relationship. Um, but nevertheless, it does show a significant. Uh, relationship between the jet latitude shift, shift for a given um, uh, energy imbalance uh, relative to the hydropause latitude relative to the jet, and since these are completely different simulations to the ones uh, used in the in the historical natural uh, forcing set, uh, this provides an outer sample test of the of the emergent constraint. Next slide, please. Okay, so if we uh, now apply this emergent constraint to the historical simulations and the future projections, uh, then we start to get some quite interesting results. So on the left uh, panel again is the raw model data. So the ensemble mean is the solid lines. Um, and you can see that uh, there's very little variability, no significant correlation uh, with the observations. Uh, and the future projections do show some sensitivity to the scenario, so the high Emission scenario SSP 585 does show an, a stronger increase than the um, than the SSP 126 scenario. Um, but when we look at the constrained uh, simulations, and, and this is again calibrated by the uh, by the um, ratio of predictable signals, which is, is again about four in these simulations. Uh, so now we start to see a significant correlation with the observations, suggesting uh, a kit. A key role for external forcing over this historical period, uh, and we also see um, quite different projections now. So, under the business as usual SSP 585, uh, the NEO increases to um, unprecedented levels, about three times a bit bigger than we've seen in this his historical period. Whereas in the other scenarios, now you can start to see a, a clear impact of. Uh, mitigation. So the SSP 245 starts to decline um, around the middle of the century, uh, and, the, and the SSP 126 declines even earlier. Um, so, yeah. So, so this unprecedented, these unprecedented levels of the NAO can can be avoided by mitigation. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to look at um, what the physical mechanism is to, to gain further confidence in this. And this shows um, Hofmuller diagram. So on the x-axis, we've got latitude from the South Pole to the North Pole. And on the y-axis, we've got time increasing downwards. And I'm showing the historical simulations uh, in the top left, uh, the natural um, simulations in the top right, and then for the three different scenarios in, in the bottom panels. And what you can see is that um, volcanic eruptions, and, and this is for, um, uh, for, for for the zonal mean temperature at 200 hectopascals, uh, which is key for controlling the, the shifts in the, in the jet, etc. And what you can see is that when, when you have volcanic eruptions, you can see a clear cooling. Uh, so if you look at the top right panel there, uh, you can see a clear, clear cooling of the, of the, um, the tropical uh, tropopause, um, and, and that would tend to shift the, uh, the jet equatorward and produce a negative NAO. Um, and then you can, so, and, and so the, the minimum in, in that occurs around about 1990 or so, uh, through the combined impact of, of three volcanic eruptions of Goeng, Elchi, John, and, and, and Pinatubo. But in the historical simulations, where we include greenhouse gases as well now, um, some of that, uh, so, so, so the greenhouse gas warming overwhelms uh, that cooling that we see in the in the natural simulations, such that the minimum in the in the greenhouse uh, in the all forcing simulations occurs around about 1960, um, and that explains, I think, why. Um, why, when, when, when we constrained the, the natural simulations, uh, the minimum was was too far. Uh, it was in around about 1980, so so too late compared to the observed minimum around about 1960. Um, and then, what, I, what I'm focusing on 
now is the is the meridional temperature gradient so, so dt bar by d phi where phi is latitude um, and i'm looking at that at the, at the latitude of the jet around about 35 north where that black line is and if you look at the um the, the business as usual projections the the bottom right panel you can see that uh, that that meridional temperature gradient just carries on increasing throughout uh, the, the time to period uh, you know I think that's explaining why why we're getting a, a continued increase to unprecedented values of the NAO whereas when you look at the scenarios that have some mitigation uh, you can see that um, that that uh, that d, d t by d phi meridional temperature gradient starts to decrease uh, and through through the action of mitigation uh, next slide please you're you're about out of time so please wrap up yeah this this is the last one so um really it's, it's, this is just trying to explain the constrained time series so at the top we have the historical natural simulations and on the bottom we have the all forcing and, and future projections um and so it's really a trend in uh, in this meridional temperature gradient that appears to explain the constrained simulations. Um, so so that's the dotted line and, and the and the solid lines are the, are the actual constrained simulations. So this suggests that actually climate will will equilibrate to a given level of forcing, and it needs further changes in the forcing to to change the NEO further. So next slide, please. So just to summarize then, so models can have very different responses, even opposite ones, so, so they definitely can't all be right. So we really should be trying to take that into account. Um, I've shown that some of the differences can be explained by background water vapor, not all of them, but some of them. And this controls the latitude of the heating in, in the upper, upper troposphere. That, that allows a constraint and that, and which reveals um, externally force uh, and NAO simulations um, such that volcanoes cool the upper troposphere produce an, an equatorward shift and an, a negative NAO whereas greenhouse gases have the opposite effect uh, under the business as usual scenario the NAO uh, is projected to increase to unprecedented levels but these can be avoided through mitigation and I think the, the main take-home message is that um, taking models at model projections at face value and seeking consensus which we often do uh, could leave society unprepared for uh, impending extremes. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Sorry, everyone, that I'm not there to uh, join you in person. I did fly home this morning, <laughs> perhaps unnecessarily. What I'd like to talk to you today about is a work that we just published Recently, um, the two papers are given by the QR codes in the bottom. The right one corresponds to a paper that just appeared in Nature Communications in February of this year. And in those papers, I worked with uh, a team of people who are part of a project I lead on extremes to examine um, how aerosols and greenhouse gases have conspired to alter rainfall over the continental United States. And the, uh, this is really a partnership between myself as a climate physicist and Mark Risser, who's a, a, a climate statistician. Next slide, please. So our goals are to understand the systematic trends in the continental United States mean and extreme precipitation, if any. Uh, and it is the um, it is evident in the sixth APCC report there was. Uh, relatively low confidence and mixed evidence about trends in precipitation of the United States, uh, despite the fact that the United States, as well as Europe, have two of the densest networks of ground-based rainfall measurements on Earth, and it, ours runs back to the late 19th century, and yet it's been uh, difficult to ascertain trends in it, and I'll show you why. Um, to attribute trends to anthropogenic forcings from greenhouse gases and aerosols, and lastly, to ask how well do models do compared to the observations? Next slide. So the forcings we're considering are, are shown here. The greenhouse gases are in the upper left. This is based off of the formula that we used in uh, 
uh, in the sixth assessment report uh, and standard time series of greenhouse gases. Um, the aerosol, the slow aerosol forcing on the lower left is from work by Chris Jones and colleagues in the UK, including the other William Collins, who's at University of Reading, Pierce Forster at Leeds, and so forth. And the, um, the black line shows their central estimate along with uncertainty bounds around the aerosol forcing uh, up to present day. Uh, for fast forcings of the continental United States, we used emissions of SO2. These were constructed and used by all of the CMIP-6 models in the upper right. And then the sum total of all those forcings is shown in the lower right. After smoothing with an appropriate uh, time constant for the ocean mix layer. And apologies for the dog sounds in the background. Next slide. So our philosophy in using model data is that um, the challenge that we face, and we've discussed this already, uh, the records of short-lived climate forces are highly uncertain, um, and the complicated response of precipitation to short-lived climate forces is also highly uncertain because it includes both direct radiative forcing as well as aerosol cloud interactions. Um, I will come back to this third point later. I know this is a controversial, perhaps controversial statement. But I'll, I'll uh, show you why I'm, I'm not sure that traditional fingerprinting um, is really viable in this context, certainly not across the multi-model ensemble for CMIP-6, and I'll, I'll defend that statement a little bit later. Um, and so what we do in this work is use models in a perfect data sense to construct a mechanism for doing detection and attribution. This is sort of in a pearl causal sense, and then pivot to using this in a Granger causal discovery mode to analyze observations and then apply exactly the same formula um, to models and, and ask whether models can get the same thing we, we found with observations. Um, and what we do basically is use the climate models to make sure that our detection and attribution is robust to structural uncertainty. Next slide, please. So uh, there are a couple slides here that are uh, relatively dense, uh, but uh, I'll, the takeaway message here is that we used a very large array of data out of CMIP-6, including the, the core deck, a set of uh, experiments that everyone had to do, the detection and attribution model and a comparison project to look at the effect, for example, of solar and volcano, the land use model and a comparison project to look at whether or not land use played an important role. Um, we used the air chem MIP to look at aerosols in, in detail and their effects and rule out most of the aerosols except sulfur dioxide and sulfate. Um, the precipitation driver and response MIP to uh, look at some idealized experiments as well. Um, and then some other experiments done by colleagues at the Pacific Northwest Lab uh, National Laboratory to ask when did aerosols from other countries other than the United States make a difference. Uh, next slide, please. This go all goes into, I do not expect you to understand this diagram. All I wanted to point out to you is that we very systematically used the models to address a series of hypotheses uh, to construct the formula that I'm going to show you in two slides. Next slide. So I do want to dwell on this slide for a minute. Uh, what we did, so the hypotheses are shown in black in the left-hand column, uh, the sort of level of confidence and um, base and evidentiary basis is shown in red in the middle. Uh, and this is using the confidence statements are using the same level of confidence used by the sixth assessment. Uh, in fact, all IPCC assessments. And then the data sets used to make those statements are shown in purple on the right hand column. So what we did was we asked, can we correctly identify the magnitude of the what makes greenhouse uh, gas effect? Um, and the answer is yes, that's good. Can we separate it um, from uh, situation where that uh, greenhouse gases are mixed in with a lot of other forcing agents? The answer is yes. Um, are there meaningful trends due to individual forcing agents? And here we tested aerosols, volcanoes, and so forth. And the answer, at least for greenhouse gases and sulfur dioxide, which leads to sulfate, is likely. Um, are most of the effects due to fast localized response to sulfur dioxide? Uh, yes, but we also included a, a, glow, a slow global response um, in looking at this problem. Can we um, 
can we understand the individual effects and can we parse them out? And the answer is yes. Um, can we distinguish well mixed greenhouse gases from aerosols? The answer is yes. Uh, and um, is the background variability and fast internal variability and in weather state, um, is it dependent on weather state? And the answer is yes. And we use this to look at signal to noise associated with weather noise. So this led to, next slide, the following formulation for how we're going to do detection attribution. So we're going to claim that precipitation is a sum of a forced response, a driven response from um, internal modes of variability and weather, uh, weather noise. And the, fast, the forced response has a slow component, and that's a sum of the well mixed greenhouse gases plus the global effect of sulfate aerosols, which are both acting on the ocean to alter sea surface temperature, and then a fast local response from uh, local radiative and aerosol cloud interactions. Uh, so the slow response is in purple, and the fast response from sulfur dioxide over the continental United States is in red. The driver response, which we've been talking about in some detail in, the, in this meeting, is P sub D, and that includes El Nino, the Atlantic Oscillation, North Atlantic Oscillation, PNA and AMO modes. And then the, the weather noise basically um, does vary with time, but for, fortunately, the signal to noise ratio there is effectively constant. Um, and this is how we interpret the observational record. Next slide, please. One complication for us is that the um, sulfur dioxide is the dominant aerosol. Over the United States, um, we can come back, I know there I've had pushback on this, but we uh, this is the conclusion based on a rigorous analysis of air Kim MIP for the historical record of the continent of the United States only. Um, I agree that aeros other aerosols can be potentially important, but this is based on a conclusion of, for air Kim MIP, and I welcome you to look at our analysis of that in the first paper. If you're concerned about this, um, it interacts, of course, both dr with directly by altering radiation as shown in this diagram, so it scatters radiation, but it also has what used to be called indirect radiative effects, or what are now known as aerosol cloud interactions, which is which are quite complicated. Next slide. And the challenge that we face is that you've got this uh, sort of uh, Rube Goldberg mechanism where you emit it uh, from the ground in the lower left. It turns into trace gases, so the sulfur dioxide in your atmosphere. And then goes off and uh, scatters sunlight, interacts with clouds, and the only thing that we think that we have a robust historical reconstruction of are the emissions. And in fact, next slide, uh, if you look at what the models do, so the emissions are in the upper left hindmost figure in this diagram, the models all agree with one another. Then if you ask how much is in the Earth's atmosphere, that's shown in the lower left in this diagram, so it's uh, the SO2. And the models differ by a factor of four, and then the sinks differ by much larger variation. In fact, the wet deposition, which is shown in the upper right, varies by, varies by about a factor of 30 across the multimodal ensemble that we considered. So this is why we do not use fingerprinting, because I, I don't know how one does fingerprinting in the, uh, in, the, in the context of such gross heterogeneity across the multimodal ensemble. So we have essentially figured out a way around this problem by cueing the fast response of the aerosols off of the, off of the emissions themselves and not off of any other uh, uh, predictant from the models. Next slide. So what we find uh, in the models is um, something that's relatively well known um, with some twists. So this is the mean response of the precipitation as a function of seasons. So the seasons are given by the rows and then the different forcing agents are shown by the columns. So let's start with the right handmost column, which is the slow response to greenhouse gas uh, forcing. And that, uh, as one would expect, results in a, as, as we models have suggested in the past, results in an increase in mean, precip in mean precipitation across a wide swath of the uh, at least eastern and high plains United States. It's shown by the fact that it's green and statistically significant. If you look at the, the response in the middle column to the, the effect of sulfate emissions worldwide, which act to cool the ocean, um, one would expect from 
what we've seen, for example, from the response to uh, volcanoes in the past, that it would dry and reduce the precipitation in the climate system. And lo and behold, we do find that signal is particularly pronounced in September, October, November, on the very bottom row of this figure. What's interesting is that the fast response, which is in the left hand of this column, is mixed. So it decreases precipitation during from December up through um, May and then actually enhances it uh, in the summer and fall months. Uh, while that might seem counterintuitive, it actually uh, agrees with the continental response uh, signal that's in PDR MIP. And you can find the details of that comparison in our second paper. Next slide, and I'm coming to the end here. Uh, so this figure shows the continental-wide response. The upper row is the mean precipitation. The lower row is the extreme precipitation. Red is greenhouse gas only, blue is the slow response to aerosols, green is fast. And then what we actually observe uh, or are trying to detect is the mix of all those things, which is black, which is anthropogenic. And in seven out of the eight panels on this figure, the anthropogenic signal emerges very late, in fact, well into the 21st century, which is one of the reasons why we think it's been exceptionally hard for the literature to come to any sort of convergence um, around whether or not there's an anthropogenic signal in the forced response of precipitation of the United States. And this is based on an exhaustive uh, error analysis uh, um, for the aerosols. Again, the details of that are given in the second paper. Uh, there's uh, the, so the, the vertical lines show you when the signal emerges. The black vertical lines in these figures show you when the anthropogenic signal would become detectable. And the only um, type of precipitation and the only season in which that emerges relatively early in the climate record is 20th century return values for September, October, November. Otherwise, very hard to see in the climate record. The last thing I want to leave you with before I close, and I know I'm, I'm down to the last minute. Next figure, uh, next slide, please. So here's what the models say. And uh, mean precipitations in the upper row, 20 year turn values in the lower row. Um, we've broken it out by forcing. These histograms show you the, the um, response of the multimodal extreme. There are about 300 model ensembles in these. And one of the, you know, the weirder things uh, in this diagram is that, for example, for mean precipitation, um, the models, this is, so this is the upper right hand figure on this diagram. The models straddle the sign of the response. And in fact, a lot of them, uh, several uh, dozen of them, uh, produce uh, decreases in precipitation over the United States. Um, over the 20 for, over the uh, 20th century. And this is after we've deprecated models that have false negatives and after we deprecate models that don't have the appropriate response to greenhouse gases from the 1% CO2 runs. So this is one of the reasons why I think fingerprinting is a relatively fraught exercise uh, for something as small as, as the United States. Next slide. So I'll be, I'll stick around for the discussion period. I really appreciate your attention. I'm sorry I'm not, I'm not there with you. And I look forward, uh, forward to our open discussion a little bit later this morning. So thank you all. And I'll, I'll be hanging around here um, to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Next, we have Yuanjan Lin from Colombia and, and as a guest talking about the influences of um, force and unforced components on clouds. And let me get this up here. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, so today, I want to discuss with you about the, um, the relative importance of the force and unforced SOC patterns in driving the time evolution of local feedback. Um, this work is collaborated with uh, Gregory Sassana, Christy Prosescu, Mark Zelinka, and Kyle Ammer. Um, so on the bottom of the slide, you're looking at the SSE pattern in two time periods, um, 50 to 80s and 80s to 2010s. On the left is the CSN2 lockdown sample, and on the right is observational data. And note that this is not the SSE trend. This is the SSE regression onto the global mean temperature. 
and I put out this set of figures because in when we think up about the radiant feedback, a lot of time people care more about how things go with global mean temperature. Um, but just as this is the trend, you can see a lot of discrepancy between models and observation in the this SST regressions, especially in the time periods 80s to 2010. Um, so in the following slides, I'm going to um, separate the the um, relative importance of the force and unforced temperature patterns, and hopefully we can um, try to understand the time evolution of the overall SSC pattern. Um, okay, so let's start with the motivation of this research. It's uh, so the, this is the time evolution of climate feedback estimated using a mid pi forcing simulation. So you prescribe models with observational SST and CIs with forcing fix at pre-industrial level. And with some of the spread, but overall we can see that radio feedback becomes more stabilizing over the past few decades, and which mostly come from cloud feedback. Um, but then if we compare these AMIP models with couple historical simulations, then things become ugly. Um, I'm inspired by Maria's talk yesterday. She said we have the good global mean temperature, um, the bad SSD trend, and then that conspired to uh, the ugly um, radio feedback. So this is, I think, um, the ugly part that for the past maybe 50 years, a couple of models have like this opposite trend of radio feedback compared to the like, AMIP simulations. Um, so, which means that um, couple model indicate that the radio feedback will become more, say, sensitive over the past few decades. Um, this discrepancy is largely attributed to the bad SSE trends. I believe I've seen this a lot. So, um, very few ensemble members capture these um, recent cooling over the Eastern Pacific, which is important for radio feedback estimation. Um, but then if we go back to Lee's comparison, I want to point out that on the, the black line, which is the uh, feedback estimate from couple models, it is the multi-model mean ensemble mean radiation against temperature. So um, we take ensemble average at the beginning um, and then calculate the um, radiation against temperature. Um, so that is, that's why you think, and the gray shading indicates the intermodal spread. So um, if, if we take the ensemble average at the beginning, kind of minimize the influence from internal variability at the first place. So maybe this is not that like by like comparison. Um, in that um, Johnson Gregory 2020 paper, they do um, discuss the difference between, say, we take the ensemble average at first um, to look at the radio feedback time evolution versus um, we look at the feedback in each ensemble member. So that's the motivation we're inspired by their work, and we try to delve deeper into this topic. Uh, so our question is simple. We know that feedback um, is the time evolution feedback is influenced by, say, internal availability and also the changing SST warning patterns. Well, but then these two are not independent, right? Um, so if time evolving SST patterns um, involve the force part and non force part, and then maybe these two um, have some interaction that we can look at. So um, this is the some this is the status framework that we laid out to uh, separate the force and unforced part of the SSE pattern. So um, for each say n year time period, it could be thirty year or forty year. The ordinary least square regression OS regression, which is commonly used to estimate radio feedback or SSE pattern. Um, so the OS regression of variable X against global mean temperature is defined as the covariance between the two over the variance of denominator. 
And if we substitute the full response of the variable X and global mean temperature with the F and U, so subscript F means force and the uh, subscript U means unforced. So we can just we can just use the large ensemble's data to say we take the ensemble average, say that is that represents the force response, and we take the anomalies relative to that ensemble average, say that would represent the unforced part. So we substitute the full response with the two and then expand the equation. And then the, the only assumption that we have to make in this derivation is that we assume the covariance between the force part and our force part is weak. Um, so if that would be the three turns highlighting yellow, and if that three turns are weak, then we can lump it into the, the four sides of the equation, the sigma turn that represents the, the covariance between the force and unforced part. And the fifth line is just the rearrangement of the force line. So we end up having the final form that um, separate the, the full response of the um, ordinary least square regression. So the full, um, if X is R, then it's, then it's feedback. So the full feedback is the force part of the feedback and the unforced part of feedback weighted by these R and Y minus R. So it's just a weighted average between the, the two components. And these um, ratio, so the weighting is just determined by the relative magnitude of the um, variance of the global mean temperature. So say if we are in the time period where we have very little variance um, for global mean temperature, then, then the, the full uh, regression are just mostly reflecting the influence from internal variability. And if we're shifting from, from, from a period where the force response is weak to you know, recently the force response is more significant, then the um, regression slopes will more and more like look like the force part of the feedback. Okay. So um, since this the this weighting is just a you know, the time varying, um, time varying say um, indicators or time varying weightings, and now we are looking at the force versus unforced global warming temperature, their variance, and their relative magnitudes in three large ensembles on your left. This is CSN two large ensemble, um, MPI. Grand ensemble and on your right, this is GIS on uh, large ensembles. Uh, we do have um, CSN2 and MPI have 100 ensemble members, but uh, I don't want to point out we have around 40 for GIS model. So, based on the previous talk, I think maybe this is not enough, but, but then I'm showing these three large ensembles. Um, on the top row, you are looking at just a Force and unforced global warming temperature in the middle, you are looking at their variance. So, um, the two vertical green lines, um, the first one, the that that is the time period between um, fifty to eighties, and so this is the this is all calculated using the moving thirty year window. So each like data point you're looking at represents some calculation within that 30 year window. So the first green line represents a window 50 to 80s and the second green line represents a window 80s to 10. And you can see that bef um, before the first be um, before the first green line, um, the variance of from the unforced global warming temperature is larger than the force part. But after the second green lines is switched up um, force part of global mean temperature, the, the variance is larger than our force part. If we think of this as a relative magnitude, which is the bottom row, that, that would be more easier to read. And that, that R, this, we can use that to determine the relative weighting between the two um, in the previous slide. So on the bottom row, this is what I want to show. Um, that before the the windows ending ending at 80s, the unforced variance 
is larger is is like point point seven or point eight. So at that at that time period, the overall feedback is mostly determined by the unforced part. Where after say twenty ten, then um, the overall feedback is determined by mostly the force part. Um, so now we are here looking at the time evolution of the SSD pattern. On your left, that is the full response. So you take the, say we have CSN2 large ensemble, we do the regression for each ensemble members, and you're looking at the average of um, let's say 100 regression maps. This is the full response. And in the middle, that is a forced response. That means you take down some ball average at the beginning. And so that is D S T F over D force global mean temperature. I hope that is clear. And the second column that is some force parts of just the relative anomalies to the um, the ensemble average. So the main point is that you can see the overall SSE pattern kind of shifting from um, force pattern to the force pattern until the end of the century, it looks just like the very uniform warming because at that time, the R is maybe 0.9 and that would just, so the overall regression will just be the force part of the SSE pattern. And what does that mean for the feedback? So here we are calculating low cloud feedback using um, meteorological relative kernels, which is estimated using observational data. So that's time variant from observations. And we combine it with the time evolution SST pattern and EIS pattern, estimated and inversion strength pattern. So, so we do this in kind of try to isolate the role of pattern effect. So here, when you look at the time evolution of local feedback, there's no, say, contribution from uncertainty of radiative forcing. There's no contribution from the sensitivity of the DR, DSST, or DR, DES, because that's not considered in this topic. We are isolating the role of pattern effect. So, um, so by this means, um, when you compare between models or when you consider the time evolutions, they are all contributed by the, um, say, time evolving SSE pattern, also intermodel spread of the SSE pattern. Okay, so here, this is the local feedback estimated using the previous methods. And on the, the top row, the, that is the local feedback due to SST changes and the bottom Role with this due to EIS changes, and I want to, I want to highlight that the EIS changes, the the range of that, um, is like three times larger than SST. So we will maybe just focus on EIS part for this talk, and um, you can see that for CSN2 large ensemble, the overall local feedback becomes more negative during the past few decades. It, it kind of moving from the blue line, which is on force feedback, to the red line, the force feedback. Um, so the the take home message is that um, to to think of how local feedback might change, um, that kind of depends on the relative magnitude of the force local feedback and on force local feedback. If if force local feedback is more positive, then we know we know that the force variance is going to like. Um, increase in the future, then, then that will lead to a more positive local feedback. Um, the opposite, opposite is also the true. Um, so, he, I think I have to wrap up, but this is just a quantification that we separate the change of the feedback into the delta one means the contribution from the change of the force feedback. The, Delta two means the change of the unforced feedback, and the delta three is the change of the relative importance. So change change of the weighting without change of the force or unforced feedback itself. And it turns out that at least as CSN two and MPI large ensemble, they agree that the um, the most of the feedback changes comes from the the third term, which is the change of the relative importance. 
So I will give the conclusion, but then I want to um, leave here. This is what I want to discuss with you all that. Um, so I, I think I, I provide some explanation regarding how we can think of the time evolution of the SST pattern and in the CSN2 large ensemble, but how do we like by like compare that with observation? I think that's still the open question. Um, I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Wanjin. Uh, so we are going to have some time for a discussion. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but could I have the speakers come back up? And let's start with a question for Yuanjen or Jeremy while I uh, rearrange things to get Bill and Doug back on the screen. So feel free to speak up and uh, raise your hand, and Alyssa will bring you a microphone while I do that. Thank you. So I have a question for John. So like you show that like for the Western US precipitation, the first least response kind of like represent the signal. So can you represent the spatial pattern over the Western US precipitation as well? And the other question is can you represent the like change in the precipitation extreme or the precipitation distribution with that like yeah, first response? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. I'll say first, we haven't really looked at extremes there. It's kind of a, a illustrative example. Um, but what models do well, uh, or at least do a decent job of, is they get a, a Western US precipitation response to the PDL. Uh, so what we did was we rescale the signal to noise ratio in the PDO pattern. Uh, so that's the precipitation response to the PDO uh, so that basically like Doug's rescaling so that the, the signal to noise ratio is correct. Because models get that uh, precipitation response to the PDO, by amplifying that, we end up getting a signal, a spatial pattern over the Western US that looks a lot more like observations. Uh, does that answer your question, Bob? So, um, yeah, I have a question for both Jeremy and Doug. So, both of what you were looking at was kind of pretty low frequency, so very few degrees of freedom. I'm just wondering if you could comment on how you address that when assessing significance, and how does that change the chances of just randomly seeing a discrepancy? Um, that's a good question. Um, so, we you know try to take that pretty seriously and do lots of statistical tests. Uh, theoretical tests attempts to, to, you know, these correlations, especially for the PDO, which is a weaker correlation, tends to be significant at like that 90 to 95 percent level. So it is not a like four sigma, five sigma result. We also do empirical tests. We kind of bootstrap these correlations. Uh, but I think part of what we're doing is we're trying to make a, a physical argument too, and that's what we're doing with the. Checking the role of forcing over time, seeing how that moves, uh, looking across multiple large ensembles where we see similar results, especially for the AMB where you need fewer ensemble members. Uh, so overall, I think we're trying to, to build evidence in addition to just kind of traditional statistical tests, which do leave a, a small chance that internal variability is contributing for this. Uh, but we're trying to use some other physical intuition too to kind of build confidence in that result. Uh, that's a good answer, Jeremy. Yeah, so we do do significance tests, and um, but for sure, I mean, there 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 could be a chance that internal variability um, could be lining up, you know, just just coincidentally um, with the force response, but it does rely on coincidence in that case. Okay, and uh, let's take a question here. Thanks, Jeremy and Doc. So I think your answer is great. So I think I have some add-ons. So um, in terms of the degree of freedom, because you know, so uh, for the forcing, it has kind of very distinct period, like since World War II. So the errors of forcing is important. So we have to isolate them. Otherwise, if we combine them like in the photo past 20th century, then it is diluted by the internal variability during the prior period, right? 
And the second thing is that we just uh, we are not just look at a uh, PPO. We are all when, when we combine them all together, like PPO, NAO, AMB, say hair rainbow, or the wing share. So this kind of increase the degree of freedom. So if all of them are you know evolving together, then that means it is robust. I would say it is forced. Thanks. Did you want to respond or? There's a question in the back, but why don't you go first? Yeah, yeah hey, uh, thank you for all the speakers. Like this session and the previous session, and yesterday, because the, um, the others um, here were really uh, wonderful. So, I have a question uh, for uh, Yuan. Yeah, Yuan, uh, I pronounce well. Okay. Um, I guess if I understood correctly, like the force response uh, started from uh, 2010, let's say, like properly. And then my question is, if this, uh, this is, a, I guess, a global signal, so uh, there are regional differences because for interpretation um, of signaling observation, really not in reanalysis, but on uh, time series, that could be um, uh, really important. I mean, because you have observation that mostly started, for example, in the 90s in the ocean, but some of them started really um when the force signal started uh, for example our goal is mostly on, on that area so for the interpretation would be um really important what we are seeing so there are regional difference from that yeah so i totally agree with you i don't um i think that is just an index for or something that we we usually scale with global mean temperature, but with say regional SST, it will have a lot of difference between different regions. So I totally agree with you that if we look things regionally, that the time shifting from unforced simulation to forced simulation would be different if we look regional SST. But um, I, I think I'm just try to provide an explanation for feedback or like this global SST pattern that usually scale with the warming temperature. I hope that helps. Yeah. So my question is uh, sort of directed at Doug Smith, but also more general. Model weighting was mentioned multiple times, but you can only weight models once. You can't weight it for NAO, you can't weight it for ECS or TCR, or you can't weight it for Upper Colorado River Basin. Um, so, if you say that if you weight the models, they agree better with observations, you don't use the card once. And so, I'm just concerned whether what to do about that. Sorry, I couldn't hear the question very clearly. So, you, you talked about constrained models to predict NAO. And you can only yeah. constrain the model once, and you can constrain it based on TCR, ECS, or sulfate aerosol response, or NAO. But you can't do it for all of them at the same time. So is it worth talking about constrained models if you can, if you can be general constraint? So, so was the question to constrain all the modes of variability at the same time. Is that is that the question? Sounds like it. So I'm struggling to hear it. I think you can interpret it the way you've stated it. Constraint. You have to you please speak into the microphone, please. Thank you. You You're speaking into the microphone. Okay. But you don't repeat that. Right. So, I have an under, I haven't followed the question well enough to repeat it for him. I'm sorry. Uh, this question this microphone seems to be working better. We are running out of time. If you could briefly summarize the question. So uh, as you stated it, you can't constrain it for just one mode of variability. Uh, they are considered for all at the same time. Yeah, so um, I 
don't know whether we could constrain everything at the same time. Is the answer to that? Sorry. Yeah, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, but I think we should try to understand why the models are different for, for you know, all the different modes of variability. Given the time, I think we can only take one last question. Um, my question is to Jeremy, and I'm still trying to formulate the question, really. But it's about this forced idea of a forced mode. And uh, what I'm wondering, how do we actually think about the forcing? And this is what I mean, like, suppose uh, the MB is forced, but there are dynamical teleconnections. Uh, MB can affect uh, NAO, it can affect PDO, it can affect uh, cycle rainfall. So could it be like uh, one of the modes is forced, like the MB, and the other correlations, what we see is basically uh, a signature of those teleconnections. Yeah, that's a, a good question and something we've been thinking about a lot. Um, I think I, I don't have a complete uh, complete thought on it, but I'd say two things. One is that if, for example, the PDO or the AMO was forced and the PDO was responding to that forcing, I don't. I don't know that we would then distinguish the PDL's unforced response. It would just be a more interesting mechanism. Um, I think, and, and this has been changing through time, but I've been kind of thinking of all of these modes as like leaf damp modes or resonant modes where we're hitting the system with forcing. And so they're all changing. Um, Tyler Fenske and Amy Clement did an interesting paper recently where they kind of looked at what is the relationship between the Atlantic and Pacific in these different modes. Um, and they only line up the way they do in observations in the ensemble mean. So maybe maybe it's the AMB that's forcing the PDO, maybe it's the other way around, maybe both are forced independently. Uh, but I don't think we can distinguish that in the forced response. And so at least in the framework of what we've done, we can consider any of those pathways to be forced. Okay, thank you. Sorry that the technical difficulties have got into the questions a bit. I think we need to move on briefly to the virtual posters before lunch. We will make sure you have enough time for lunch and we'll shift it back accordingly. Let's see how long the virtual posters take. I do encourage you to reach out to Doug and Bill if you have uh, questions for them. Of course, uh, Jeremy and Yuan Jen are, are here in person and feel free to talk to them here. So uh, we'll now be moving on to the um, virtual poster. Um, uh, brief presentations before lunch. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present virtually today. Um, really enjoyed the meeting so far too. Um, my poster. Sorry, my name is Alec Petty. I'm a polar climate scientist at the University of Maryland. Um, and the poster today will be sharing some preliminary results um, from a project funded by NASA's um, ICE2 science team. Um, yeah, please do get in touch. If you have questions about the poster, my emails on this first slide here. I think it's on the poster too. Our overall kind of project goal is how to better reduce intermodal spread or uncertainty in um, future sea ice projections. Um, so, yeah, motivated by plots like this on the right that I know many of you have seen before showing um, the various CMIP 6 model projections of, of September Arctic sea ice area. The point being there's different sources of uncertainty as has been discussed already at this meeting um, where we're mostly concerned with trying to better constrain the intermodal uncertainty contribution to that total uncertainty. Um, for efforts that kind of led up to the last IPCC report, a lot of the calibration efforts or kind of basic um, model exclusion efforts um, were undertaken using observations um, of sea ice area from the passive microwave record, that kind of very nice 40-year um, record of sea ice area and extent. Um, but the point of our project is, is there's a lot more fancier, um, detailed, high-fidelity observations of the sea ice state that we could maybe utilize for calibration too. So we're most con um, concerned with the um, altimetry record. So um, the laser altimetry data from ISAT and ISAT-2, and then also the radar altimetry data from CryoSat-2. Um, 
the, the problem with that data set is it's not quite so easy to use as the passive microwave observations. So um, observations from altimetry give us an estimate of height, and from height we can back out freeboard, um, freeboard being the extension of sea ice above sea level. Um, and then we have to bring in a lot of additional input assumptions um, regarding the snow loading and the ice density to convert that measurement of freeboard to, to an estimate of thickness. Um, so that really radically increases the uncertainty of the observational estimate. Um, so our approach is to kind of think about this a little bit differently. And instead of um, comparing thickness to thickness, we try and simulate um, freeboard in the models um, and compare that with the more direct satellite measurement. Um, and luckily for us, um, several of the CMIP-6 models are already starting to output those um, metrics. So the poster gives a bit more background on the um, analysis approach we, we're already taking. Um, here's some of the nice results we have already. So currently we're just looking at the kind of seasonal cycle in, um, we're showing sea ice area on the left here and then that, that total freeboard metric that I just explained on the right. We've got the Arctic on the top and we've got the Southern Ocean on the bottom. Um, we've got, this is all CMIP-6 uh, model output and then observations are shown by the white circles. Um, so there's a lot here that we can kind of talk about. It's better to maybe read the poster and um, take a look at this yourself. But the point being there's kind of differences in the seasonal biases between the observations and the models based on the different metrics we're looking at. Um, we're also trying to then start to look at trends, which is why I was kind of motivated by this workshop. Um, so the blue line is showing a more historical record of those metrics too. Um, so we're trying to think about how to bring in uncertainties and um, the observational estimates and um, use that to try and maybe constrain what those um, simulated trends might be and how to undertake some more fancy calibration methods. Thanks very much. I, I can talk while you're bringing the picture up on the screen. Um, so seasonal forecasting uh, these days the global warming signal is really dominating uh, the seasonal forecasts particularly for temperature um, okay that's good uh, that's the top left picture you can see that's the forecast for this summer um, so we're very keen to try and get the season the, the, the global warming signal as accurately as we can in the seasonal forecasts some things we get right, others we don't. Um, that's a plot of uh, mid tropospheric temperature, global mean, uh, including the extreme warming we've seen over the last year. But you'll notice that although the right hand part of that is okay in the 1980s, uh, the red dots are the model forecasts at seven, six months lead, they're too cold. One of the things we're worried about is aerosol. We know we don't. We've not had a very good representation of time varying aerosol in our system. So it's something we've worked to improve. We have in house in our CAM system a uh, actually rather well validated aerosol model. It's used for uh, forecasting air quality, uh, 16 aerosol species, 125 chemistry species, a lot of work. It's improved a lot over recent years. We've really seen improvement. So we've used that uh, to construct a, a time varying aerosol climatology with all of the, the latest versions of the emissions from SETS and uh, biomass burning and so on. Uh, we think we've got actually a, a as good as good as as good as anyone else in terms of a representation of the, of the time varying aerosols. Uh, we think the direct radiative forcings we get are good, but when we put it in our system, we discover that actually the cloud feedbacks are really rather rubbish in our model. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when we put it all together and look at the thirty year trends in temperature, we see things like this. Uh, at a forecast lead time of a few months. Uh, era 5 is on the left for June, July, August, SON. Um, the four seasonal forecasts are on, on, on the right-hand side. You'll see that over Europe, for example, we're underestimating the warming trend over the last 30 years. And we think that is because we've got the cloud feedbacks wrong. Uh, hit, hit, has hit a button again. And uh, the message really is we, we all know it's a hard problem, aerosols, trends, cloud interactions. This is tough. Uh, operational forecasting centers need to do this as well. Uh, we've got some good things we can bring to the table, uh, particularly the initialized forecasts, a lot of validation data. On the other hand, we're still uh, a long way behind on some areas, such as our cloud aerosol microphysics. Um, so I think, you know, options for the ability to work together is, uh, is going to be helpful all around. Thank you.
and come and see the poster. There's a poster that uh, explains things in a lot more detail and also talk to me or any of my ECNWF colleagues to learn more. Thank you. Yeah, I can see them. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Shreya. I am a postdoc at MPI in Germany, and I'm going to talk about whether land and ocean surface temperature discrepancies compensate each other. Um, and so we've heard a lot about SST discrepancies in this workshop, uh, especially the delayed warming pattern in the tropical Pacific and in the Southern Ocean. And so, as a first order check, we wanted to see whether this translates into a global mean SST uh, change uh, in models um, as a discrepancy. And also, if yes, whether global mean land surface temperatures and the ocean temperatures compensate each other to then give us a GMST trend during this period, which is comparable to observations. And secondly, also to check if there is a systematic land surface pattern discrepancy in models. And so to do this, uh, we use nine large ensembles listed here and then describe discrepancies as when the observed trend is plus minus two standard deviations away from the ensemble mean trend of each model. Next slide, please. And so the figure on the left um, shows the correlation between the global mean uh, land temperature trend bias uh, with the global mean SST trend bias. And what we see is apart from CAN-ESM, which overestimates um, surface temperature trends everywhere. Okay, my camera's off. Um, some models do show an underestimated underestimation of the SSC trend bias and overestimation of uh, temperatures over land, uh, but this is not a consistent response across models. And the figure on the right shows the median pattern discrepancy across models. So areas which are stippled uh, is where observations lay plus minus two standard deviations away for at least six models out of the nine models used here. And so we do see there is some consistent overestimation of land surface temperature trends over parts of North America, um, East Africa, the West Coast of South America, and also over the maritime continent. And if we look at individual pattern discrepancy maps across models, there are some regionally compensating errors, but overall there is no land versus ocean compensation in surface temperature trends. And so some of the questions that we're asking now is how much can we trust observations, especially over tropical land areas where uh, models also show the largest variance in the pattern discrepancy, which is not something I show here, but is on my poster. Um, and also, secondly, what causes these uh, different trend biases over land in different models? And so if this is something that you can comment on or would like to discuss, we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you. So I'm Kate Willett from the Met Office, and this is some work that I've been doing with Josh Blanin. And we are looking at how plausible is the observed signal of decreasing RH over oceans. And this is using my own climate monitoring product, HADISDH. So this is an in situ based climate monitoring product, which uses observations from ships over the ocean and weather stations over land. Um, and we've also got ear of fire, right? So these are decadal trend maps that you're looking at in relative humidity. Uh, the uh, the decreasing trend over land is reasonably well understood, but I was really surprised to see this decrease over ocean, and even more surprised to see it not only in had SDH my own products, but also in um, Era Five. <laughs> Hang on, Rudy, just give me a minute. Um, and so, uh, SDH over ocean, it does not assimilate temperature and dew point over the oceans. Um, so it's, again, this is a very surprising result, but it's one that at the moment I feel there is low confidence in. Um, can you just click the button on the slides, please? So, um, and this is this is very much work in progress. There's more questions than answers on this, um, on the poster. Click again, please. Um, 
So we've also been looking at the models. Um, this is again early work, and we wanted to understand whether there was any climate model consensus on near surface ocean RH and how plausible that might be. So my colleague Josh um, has taken to start with just the Hadley Centre models, and we have spatially matched those to the very limited coverage of Had ISDH, and they tell us that we might expect to see actually a small increase in relative humidity over oceans rather than a decrease. You can see Had ISDH here in black. Um, and you can see the variability is much larger in HADSDH. Um, but really, there is an inconsistency between the models and between HADSDH and ERA 5. Um, can you click again, please? But my naive understanding of the models at the moment is that there's actually probably medium or more like medium to high confidence in the models. This is something the models should do quite well. But um, uh, having listened for the last couple of days, uh, I think there's a lot more for me to understand from the models. And there are some odd things going on, such as um, the models predictive humidity above 100% uh, for various reasons. And that's something we have to deal with when we do this analysis. Can you click again, please? And then finally, we've we've done a lot more digging into the observations themselves because there are many known large um, sources of uncertainty. And here we wanted to know whether any of those observational issues could possibly explain a spurious decrease in relative humidity over ocean. And can you click one final time, please? And the answer here is, is maybe. Um, we do have metadata for the observations, but it ends in 2014, so it's quite limited. And obviously the spatial coverage of the observations is very limited, so it's very hard to um, do any conclusive analysis on this. But we have looked at the spatial coverage and we've compared ERA 5 with full coverage versus HAD ASDH. It doesn't make much difference. We've looked at changes in ship heights because they are increasing over time, which could cause a decrease in RH. But we adjust for this in HAD ASDH. We adjust for instrument changes and differences. Um, I've also looked at a moored boy only version to compare with the ships because that's independent. And we've also been looking at ERA 5 because we know that although it does agree with HAD ISDH, it does have instabilities within itself because of changing data streams. Um, so come along to the poster, see what we've been up to, um, and I think um, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mary Beth Arcodia. I'm at Colorado State University. I apologize. I'm not able to attend in person today with the snowstorm as I'm in Fort Collins, but my poster is there in person. Uh, my work here diverges a bit from many of the talks we've seen in that I'm using climate models to explore the sub seasonal predictability of summertime precipitation from a fairly untapped source of predictability, sea surface salinity, and then verifying these relationships relationships in reanalysis. Uh, click, please. To do this, we use a neural network approach in which we use 10 ensemble members from the CESM2 large ensemble data set. We input North Atlantic sea surface salinity anomalies to predict whether or not there'll be a heavy precipitation event with a three-week lead where a heavy event means above the 80th percentile. With each neural network prediction, we have an associated confidence, which we rank from least to most confident on the x-axis. And then when we plot accuracy as a function of confidence, we see that as confidence increases, accuracy also increases, highlighting predictable states of the climate system from which the predictions were made, deemed forecasts of opportunity, outlined here in the gold box. So click. We see that the North Atlantic sea surface salinity anomalies do in fact provide predictability for summertime Midwest precipitation events. Click. We next use explainable AI or XAI techniques to understand why a network made a forecast of opportunity. Here on the left, I've composited the salinity maps, which resulted in a correct and confident heavy precip prediction. And we see that in the Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico regions, there are saltier waters, uh, the green colors, indicating evaporation and moisture available to be transported out of the region. Then on the right, when we compute the sensitivity of each grid point, we find that the saltier waters in those regions increase the confidence of the predictions and click. So we find that sub seasonal forecasts of opportunity are informed by positive salinity anomalies in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Click. 
Lastly, to verify if these relationships hold in the real world, we, empl we employ a moisture tracking algorithm using ERA-5 data in which we track where moisture fell in the Midwest red box region, where that moisture originally evaporated from. And while a decent amount of the moisture is locally recycled, we find that click the regions of evaporation identified by the neural networks, the Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico regions, provide a direct moisture source for Midwest precipitation. Click. This work is currently submitted to GRL with a preprint publicly available via the QR code. I've also um, provided my contact information and I'm more than happy to chat afterward. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, so in this uh, work, I'm looking at uh, the effect of changing ocean resolution uh, on ENSO simulation. And I, well, this matters for good uh, intranual variability, but also it possibly um, is relevant to trends because we know that the trends are pretty, well, the models and the observations disagree in the tropical Pacific. And we know that there are issues uh, um, in the tropical Pacific. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, so basically what I was looking at here was a couple of free running pyramids MIT models. Um, so I took a fairly large ensemble of models with one degree ocean and models with a quarter degree ocean, um, and then compared to ENSO simulation. Um, so a long-standing er error, which is in the low resolution models at the bottom, is that the warm SST during El Nino, the cool SST during La Nina extend too far west. Um, if you compare it to the OBS at the top, um, but when the resolution is increased a quarter of a degree, this problem is pretty much eliminated. Um, and you also get a slightly better um, simulation on the coast of South America. Um, and although I don't show it in this slide, the asymmetry between uh, El Nino and the Nina improves. Uh, next slide, please. So um, another thing I looked at was we saw that uh, these improvements in the tropical Pacific, um, uh, but I also looked in the extratropics in the North Pacific, um, where here I'm looking at the basically the Aleutian low response, where the Aleutian low deepens during El Nino and gets shallower during La Nina, um, and kind of uh, in line with what we see in the tropics, uh, the teleconnection is too far west in the low resolution models. These line contours just show the observations in all. Uh, all of the panes. Um, but when you increase resolution, uh, in the high resolution case, the teleconnection ends up in pretty much the right position. Um, but in the low resolution, uh, sorry, in, during the Nina, the teleconnection ends up still being too far west um, in the models, uh, this uh, positive geopotential height response. Um, and yeah, basically, come to my poster to uh, understand why the El Nino and the Nina changes are different, um, but basically it comes down to what's going in the tropics, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. So yeah, thank you.